Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I am Cynthia Roman, Curator of Prints, Drawings, and Paintings at the Lewis Walpole Library. Um, on behalf of the library and my co-organizer, Holly Schaefer, oh, Assistant Professor of Art History and uh, at Brown University, I am delighted to welcome all of you to our second workshop in the series, Viewing Topography Across the Globe uh, Indigeneity. So a few practical matters first. Um, everyone, I think, saw the message, but this program is being recorded. And the plan is that it will be posted on um, the YUL YouTube um, or whatever Sue um, works out. Um, please keep yourselves muted um, with your video off during the presentations so we can preserve our, our bandwidth and avoid distractions. Um, there will be a live transcript um, available as a default, but you can turn it off if you choose. Um, and Sue Walker has noted that for some reason, Zoom live transcript doesn't seem to recognize the word topography. So um, that's being um, transcribed as typography and we're sorry for that. Um, so the other thing is that we will hear from all the panelists first before uh, turning to a question and discussion um, with the audience and the panelists. So, um, and at that time, we ask you to type your question into the chat, um, or if you prefer just to say that you have a question that you would like to ask, um, and we will call on you to turn on your um, audio and video and ask your question yourself. Um, and finally, there will be a 15 minute break um, at the conclusion of the panel discussion um, before we start the keynote at noon. So, um, as our program today uh, expressly seeks to interrogate the relationship of peoples, nations, and land, it seems especially fitting to open our program with Yale's land acknowledgement statement. So uh, I will read it. Yale University acknowledges that indigenous peoples and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoc, Golden Hill, uh, Paugusset, Nihantic, and the Quinnipiac, and other Algonquin speaking peoples have stewarded through generations the land and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this land. Um, I offer here um, an amendment to acknowledge and honor indigenous people um, absent or unnamed here. Um, in particular, the site of the Lewis Walpole Library was the homeland of the Tunxis tribe that is made up of many tribes displaced by colonialism. And among the Tunxis tribes are the Wangon peoples who for centuries stewarded and cultivated the exceptionally beautiful and fertile land um, in my hometown of Portland located on the big bend of the Connecticut River. And I want to thank um, my friend Paul Grant Costa of the Native Northeast Research Collaboration for his help um, in make, helping me understand these relationships. And I hope I, I got it right. So um, a first workshop on viewing topography across the globe as part of the Lewis Walpole Library series on topography took place in December 2019 at the um, John Carter Brown Library and the John Hay Library and was organized, um, sorry, by, uh, with Holly Schaefer, Neil Saf Safier, and Shahad, Shahzad Bashir. Um, and I think, uh, yep, um, uh, sorry, Michelle, uh, Kristen is going to put that link in the chat. Um, a second workshop in this series was to follow in spring 2020 as an in-person gathering on Yale's campus in collaboration with the History of Art Department at Yale and with visits to Yale Special Collections. And this program would have coincided with the exhibition Place, Nations, Generations, Beans, 200 Years of Indigenous North American Art at the Yale University Art Gallery. Uh, and we also have that in the chat. 
For those who could not see it, I strongly recommend the catalog and the museum website. So we are of course disappointed that the gathering in person with collections is still not possible. And at the same time, we are delighted that Zoom allows so many to join us virtually. We hope our program today will tempt you to join us in person for future iterations of topography programs. And we are grateful to our contributors, contributors for their patience with postponement and restructure. And we thank Professor Tim Berenger for his encouragement and support in planning um, this program. So we define topography, um, which is a, going to be a, a topic potentially of discussion, as a range of strategies for describing, understanding, or imagining the land, history, and inhabitants of a particular place. Typography, topography is uh, a European term and concept. The word comes from Greek and means the study of place. Today, it is often associated with an aerial view of land, but in the early modern period, we draw specifically on 18th century British definition. Topography focused on any visual or even written record of place, be it a landscape, townscape, or the city itself, the documentation of architecture, sculpture, or artifacts in an antiquarian mode. Part of our project is to recognize the power of topography to frame relationships with the land and to work on reframing it by thinking with indigeneity. Our goal in this two-day workshop is to think closely about European topographic practices, indigenous modes of placemaking, and the various ways they have intersected and continue to intersect. Representations of place and inhabitants from the Anglo 18th century inevitably reached across the centuries to inflect ongoing global concerns about land, nations, and people. Our hope over these two days is to ref reflect on topography as a specific historical practice and to place it in relation to other modes of placemaking. How does topography look in the global context? How can art making both locate and disrupt notions of place? Today, in connection to the Americas, we'll learn from artists, curators, and academics about map making, landscape painting, written language, mythic forms, and the artist as a bridge maker. Tomorrow, we'll turn to South and Southeast Asia and the Pacific to consider the representations of temples, the visualization of moods, understanding of oceanic space and genealogy, mineralogy, and the medium of aqua tint. So um, with that, we can begin um, our panel. And I will introduce our first um, panelist. I guess first I should stop sharing so that Barbara can share. So um, our first panelist is Barbara Mundy. Uh, Barbara is professor of art history at Fordham University, who has published work on indigenous cartography and Latin American urbanism. In 2021 to 22, she will hold the Kislak chair at the Library of Congress. Um, Barbara will speak to us today about indigenous bodies and topographical imagination. So Barbara. Thank you, can you hear me? Okay, great, super. So I was so happy for this invitation from Cynthia Roman, the curator of the Walpole Collection and Holly Schaefer, a fellow art historian, um, to reflect on the uses of topography in the early modern context. Today, let's not get ahead here. There we go. So today I want to address the relationship between printed topographical views, an enormous industry in Europe in the 16th through the 18th century, and an idea of an imperial conceit. So what I'm gonna do now is sketch out this idea of imperial conceit, and then turn to an extraordinary work in the Walpole collection, which Cynthia kindly introduced me to which you see in the background here. I'll first set up the idea of imperial conceit 
that has shaped our understanding of topographic maps and end by offering a way of thinking beyond it. The relationship between cartography and imperialism lies at the foundations of most contemporary theories about the early modern map. The idea of imperialism has also shaped the historiography of cartography, particularly European cartography, which often begins with the portaling charts of the 14th century. And then it's, these are later tied to Portuguese and Spanish expansion. Later printed maps, here. Later printed topographical maps gave Europeans a visual purchase on faraway lands, domesticating them and making them legible for imperial agendas. An early example is Bernhard von Preutenbach's Peregrinato in Terram Sanctum, meant to guide and encourage the retaking of Jerusalem, then controlled by Muslim conquerors. Now, the insane hubris of the idea of a handful of soldiers capturing a major imperial hub is the historical foundation of what I call imperial conceit. And here I underscore the idea of conceit as an overweening idea of oneself. In the Peregrinato, the uniform format of its sheets struck a balance between the familiar template used for cities with enough particular detail to convince the viewer of the veracity of its views, as Elizabeth Ross has recently argued. At the same time, the representation of empire as an emblematic urban form, seen through the desirous eyes of their would-be European captors, contained and diminished foreign cities. Now, had Jerusalem been the only topographic object of desire for Europe, the repeated failures, I will say repeated failures of men from various European regions to capture it would have curtailed such imperial conceits. The topographic map of Jerusalem, which you see here, was once, once a sign of its potential availability to Christian Europe, would have been overwritten by other narratives like its exoticism, or its unassailable distance. And scholars might have created a different historiographic narrative about the role maps played in Europeans' expansion over the 16th through the 19th century. Instead, this map entered into play. It's a map of Tenochtitlan, a city at the center of the Aztec capital. It was published in Nuremberg, the publishing center for topographic views. And it was meant to accompany the Latin edition of a letter sent by the conquistador Hernando Cortes to the Spanish monarch, Charles V. When the letter that it accompanied was written in 1520, this map would have been exactly like those maps of Jerusalem, a reflection of an imperial conceit, another example of a handful of soldiers fantasizing that they could capture a major imperial hub. But by the time it was published in 1524, the conceit was no longer an overweening idea held by some career adventurers of their military prowess. Instead, it was a reality. By 1524, the Cortez map of Tenochtitlan converted fantasy into reality as Aztec Tenochtitlan had fallen to the Spanish forces and their allies. The Cortez map was republished and repurposed over time. And on the screen, you see a little of this genealogy leading up to America being an accurate description of the new world, an English translation of a Dutch work published by John Ogilvy in 1671, you see in the lower right-hand corner. In short, the Cortez map functioned as an emblem of a seeming imp seemingly impossible imperial conceit, the conquest of a foreign kingdom whose riches would underwrite Spain's global empire. Its ubiquity in European publication broadcast that message for over three centuries. It was aspirational. When appearing or versions of it appearing 
in 17th century, in late 17th century Dutch publications or coeval British ones like this one, one can imagine a British Lord, perhaps the first Earl of Godolphin saying, if those Spaniards can do it, why can't we? It was this interpretive frame that I brought to bear to this image, a plate mounted into the extra illustrated edition of Seeley's volume on Walpole of 1884. It's a laid paper sheet with painted figures at the side. At the center is a cut out and pasted down version of the Cortez map. Here is an etched copy of Ogilvy and Montanus's uh, map of 1671 at the bottom for comparison. Um, this and its presence existence in a British album make me think that the collaged map might've been etched in Britain perhaps in the 18th century. The painted surround was intended to seamlessly extend and add to the map's imagery. We do not know the name of the creator, but he or she has added two prominent figures to the left. One is an Aztec warrior, as those exotic figures were imagined in Europe, and another a male figure carrying what appears to be a handbag with fixing for that evening salad. The creator's imagination was fed not by a real encounter with such persons, but by images of Amerindians that circulated as books or single sheet prints, particularly those engraved plates that appeared in Montanus's and later Ogilvy's work, where the source of the map came from as well. And the creator's decision to pair um, a topographical view in the background with foreground figural types follows the patterns that we see established in the great topographical atlases of the 16th century, like Brown and Hogen Hogenberg's Kiwitates Orbis Terrarum, where you also see this a version of the Cortez map on the left with the figural types in the, in the foreground. The creator's confidence in assigning certain bodies to certain places slots near, neatly into the imperial conceit so manifest in topography, as Valerie Traub has explored. These ass assignments were grounded in 16th century notions that human bodies are constituted by places of origin, that stars and climate have a determinate effect on who a person fundamentally is. To fast forward, such an ideology was adopted and adapted by the nation state to tether people to place and to naturalize that connection through citizenship. It's an ideology that is tested and contested in our present moment as real life people, many of them of Amerindian descent, dislocated by political violence and climate change are uprooting in a desperate search for a new hospitable place. But I'd like to return to the imperial conceit and to its definition as overweening idea. The collage map reveals the work of an amateur painter. The face of the figure seems uncertain whether it's profile or frontal and the collage map appears through the scrim of the bodies. Empire is certainly about control of bodies and their labor, but how much of what we encounter in the historical record is simply metropole arrogance? Yet another line of argument offers a way of moving beyond a predetermined imperialist interpretation of topographic maps of the colonial hinterlands. Our tendency to privilege the visual as the most truth-bearing of all cultural artifacts is itself a product of the 18th century. And it's been intensified by image theorists of the 1960s like Guy Debord, whose work on the spectacle asserted that in form as in content, the spectacle serves as total justification for the conditions and aims of the existing system. Relatedly, Laura Mulvey has instructed us in the implicit power of the modern gaze. But would we be better served if 
we in our under, in the understanding of the relationship between visual artifacts and power relationships, particularly the place of subaltern subjects, if we were less eager to link vision and the act of seeing with power and more attuned to its conceits. While I framed topographical maps in this brief talk as the visual emblems of imperial conceits, what would their relationship to, to, ter to territorial control begin to look like when vision is discounted as an instrument of power and the primary means of knowing? Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. That was really a perfect opening to our discussions. Um, and I have lots of questions already. Um, and I don't see my little um, reactions to clap, but Sarah, do it the old fashioned way. Um, and I'm suddenly losing things here. In any event, um, Sorry, having technical difficulties. Um, so next, our next speaker is Emmanuel Ortega. Emmanuel is the Marilyn Toma Scholar in Art of the Spanish Americas at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Ortega is co-producer of the education YouTube channel, Unsettling Journeys, and his essay, The Mexican Picturesque and the Sentimental Nation, a study in 19th century landscape um, and is uh, forthcoming in June, 2021 in the issue of Art Bulletin. Emmanuel's talk, Local versus Universal Knowledge, Locating Place in Van Hobelt's Picturesque. Um, Emmanuel, over to you. Hi everyone. Thank you to Holly Schaefer, Cynthia, and Michelle Privé for this um, invitation. Start. The aesthetic and ideological tools that define the experienced landscape of late 18th and early 19th century European travelers in the Americas were first imported via Alexander von Humboldt writings such as views of the Cordilleras and monuments of the indigenous peoples of the Americas from 1810, with his attention to natural specificity was felt in Latin American critical circles. Mexican artists, for instance, adopted this approach to nature and science in order to develop a comprehensive study of all things Mexican through its visual and printed culture. More specifically, Humboldt's approach to native epistemologies as continental, ontological, and scientific tools became useful to a nascent country who struggled between appending an imperial pre-Columbian past to the ideals of the nation, while simultaneously disenfranchising contemporary lower class populations. Views of the Cordilleras aimed to render American landscape as a neo-colonial enterprise, ready to be extracted of its resources by Spain and other European powers. Humboldt's writings reordered the vast and diverse spaces of American nature into, into controlled colonial places, map representations of history and politics, wherein national formation becomes legitimized. As in many European visual culture programs in the quote unquote new world, indigenous cultures were reduced to teleological precedents, ruins in effect of grand cultures in a classical hierarchy. Their contemporary existence reduced to, reduced to mere staffage in narratives of lost history. It is no coincidence that his travels to South America are concentrated on the mountain ranges of the Andes, also known as the Cordilleras, an area where Humboldt assures us that the developed development of civilized peoples and their faculties did not succumb to the proactive, proactive struggle of growing nature. Landscape, in other words, 
was not the only entity transformed in the encounter with the enlightened traveler. In Humboldt's accounts, native peoples were rendered as encounter fauna, practical only for their knowledge of the region. Indigenous peoples, almost invisible, were the conduit that would allow enlightened travelers to find universal truths in a landscape that was never fully tamed in previous colonial interventions. In the words of French philosopher Bruno Latour, quote, the implicit geography of the natives is made explicit by geographers. The local knowledge of the savages becomes the universal knowledge of the cartographers, end of quote. Understanding geography here as the experience, survey, and transverse terrain, we must recognize how there existed a need to transform local indigenous knowledge of the land into universal ontological and scientific truths. The impulse to converse belief systems into quantifiable knowledge should be comprehended as a colonial violence of altering spaces into consumable places. In the section titled Volcancitos de Turbaco, we see an illustration that expresses the binary between regional versus universal knowledge. It displays a landscape dominated, dominated by the little volcanoes or the volcancitos, where a European traveler is shown in the middle ground pointing towards the terrain as if to explain their raciest nature to the local Native American. The quote unquote Indian is depicted naked to establish further differences between civilized and wild. Here, the local regional knowledge is displaced by the universality of the traveler's scientific experience. The position of the Native American when coupled with humble scientific inquiry and romantic sensibilities solidifies the trope of the voyage or what other scholars have referred to as imperial picturesque. The presence of Native Americans in Air Volcano and in several other images produced for views of the Cordilleras merely reiterated the traveler's solipsistic approach to nature. As noted by sociologist Ramon Grossfogel, Europeans' epistemic solipsism, which permeates all levels of epistemological production in the so-called Western world, consists in the Cartesian belief that knowledge can only be produced from the eye to the eye. That is, an internal monologue that results in the certainty of knowledge. The knowledge produced in this ontological monologue gives rise to, quote, the myth of an ego that produces unbiased knowledge, unconditioned by its body or space location. The idea of knowledge is produced through an internal monologue without links with other human beings, end of quote. The absence of dialogical learning allows for the illusion that anything with this within this ontological production has universal applications. For Humboldt, the epistemic solipsism is dependent on nature. And given the wide dissemination of his personal writings, which also represent ethnographic testaments of Kantian philosophy, the assertion of the traveler's subjectivity through landscape was always at the forefront of his agenda. Consequently, indigenous people's knowledge of the region can only have applications to the universal epistemic framework of Humboldt. They must be placed as part of the nature that concedes the claim of European supremacy. And now I want to fast forward towards the end of the 19th century. During the Porfirian era, which is characterized by its ambitions of inserting Mexico into an artistic, scientific, and industrialized international arenas. A significant economic prosperity was attained through the considerable growth of its mining and textile industries and urban centers, all of which depended heavily on foreign capital and its ever-growing railroad truck construction. During this era, Landscape artists such as Jose Maria Velasco, Antonio Garcia Cubas, and Casimiro Castro all depicted vistas in which trains slice through idyllic landscapes, thereby dismantling myths of Mexico as a wild frontier 
especially considering how many of these artists exhibit in international expositions such as Paris in 1889 and Chicago in 1893. This effectively created an image of stability and progress abroad. The widespread international views of Mexico as a backward and war-torn impelled Diaz to develop strategies to change the country's economy, and as a consequence, the negative views of a retrograde society. The question of the quote-unquote Indian and his capacity to be integrated into this rapidly modernizing society pervaded private and public intellectual debates. The public discourse isolate, oscillated between indigenous population as either the key to industrial development or obstacles to the country's modernization. The question of the Indio to elite members of fin de cicle Mexican society were best expressed in the images illustrating scientific surveys, which were increasingly commissioned by the Mexican government during this period of economic prosperity. Nationalists and international artists repeated the Humboldtian formula of local versus universal, pictorial gestures many times throughout the 19th century. Consider these comparisons between Mexican artists and humble followers. On the top, we have Las Monjas at Chichen Itza from John Lloyd Stevens' Incidents of Travels of 1843, illustrated by Frederick Catherwood. And on the bottom, we see Mitla, which frames the map in Antonio Garcia's y Cuba's Carta Historica. In both instances, Native Americans face away from the towering ruins, ignorant of their historical importance. Since the publication of Humboldt's volumes, the visual culture of Mexico has been filled with these examples in which the presence of Native Americans serve only as anchors to imperialistic and later nationalistic fantasies of progress and modernity. One prominent example is Casimiro Castro's lithograph Infiernillo of 1877, published in El Álbum del Ferrocarril Mexicano. Here we see two men that are pla placed precariously at the edge of a rock formation at the bottom left. The local peasant sits in awe of the machine transversing the landscape across the canyon. Another man in Western clothing who holds a notebook firmly in his hand stands next to what appears to be an easel, implying an artistic and scientific approach to the technology in front of him. In addition, in this publication, the writings and the images exalt nature. Knowledge of the terrain is described in topographical detail. And while peasant figures abound throughout, they are never acknowledged. The dichotomy in Infiernillo, as in many of the album's plates, indicates the Van Humboldt up, Van Humboldtian approach to local and universal knowledge. One in which the indigenous figure, similar to his physical position in this canyon, is precarious and useful only to his more letter counterpart. The Porphyrian era created a visual culture that aimed to maintain the coloniality of power relations to reckon with the nation's imperial past. This image has not only reproduced the violence found in the publications of the imperial colonial project, but also crystallized the sentimental perceptions of the lower classes in the popular imaginary or indigenous peoples as well. All affirmation examples position the Native American or those deemed as low class in a space where they are reduced to mere specks of color, present only to articulate the ontological and scientific supremacy of those in power. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, that was wonderful. Um, and it's it, the papers are going to work together so well for discussion. Um, our next speaker is um, Robbie Richardson, um, who is assistant professor in the Department of English, Princeton University. Um, his interdisciplinary research ex explores the interactions between indigenous and European cultures. Um, and his next book project 
um, is on the history of indigenous objects from the Americas and the South Pacific in Europe up to 1800. He is a member of the Pabano First Nations Mi'kmaq um, in New Brunswick, Canada. Um, Robbie's paper is on suckerfish writings, indigenous inscriptions, and the history of written language in uh, the 18th century. So, Robbie. There we go. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Great. It's not on slideshow though. Oh, there we are, all set. Great. Hi everyone. Um, so I will begin. Uh, Mi'kma'ki is the homeland of my father's people, the Mi'kmaq. And it is where my family still live after thousands of years. It covers now uh, what's now known as the Maritime Provinces in Canada, uh, as well as parts of Quebec and Maine. Traditionally, it was divided into seven districts, each with a regional chief and one grand chief governing all the affairs as part of a council that met annually. These councils then determined hunting and fishing access uh, and its governance was strictly followed. Early missionaries and explorers noted a hospitable society, leading Jacques Cartier to observe of the Mi'kmaq living in villages of 300 around the Bay of Chalor in 1525, where my family still live incidentally around the Bay of Chalor, that they quote, would be easy to convert to our holy faith. In 1616, Father Biard uh, described Mi'kma'ki as a commonwealth and noted the division of the land into hunting districts, as well as the continuous regulation and use of land and water. In a Portuguese map from 1554, the northern coast of Mi'kma'ki is described as the place of many people by the Portuguese cartographer, and numerous indigenous place names appear on the map. These incidentally are among the oldest named indigenous places in the Americas from a European map. It was an inhabited and loved landscape. We have a long history of European contact and European invasion, dating back a thousand years to Viking incursions. And much of it relates to the rich supply of fish in our waters. The traditional hats of Mi'kmaq women are said to be derived from those of medieval Basque women, since we traded with Basque fishermen starting in the Middle Ages. The French first, first called us the Syroquois, or the saltwater people. Over this past year, the relationship between the Mi'kmaq and white settlers has received international attention. As Mi'kmaq fishers in Nova Scotia were attacked and their property destroyed by racists for attempting to fish for a moderate livelihood under the terms of several 18th century treaties. If ever there was evidence to the enduring structure of Canadian settler colonialism, it is certainly here in this conflict, which I will not get into further, but which is still in many ways unresolved. Mi'kmaq topography, the relation to the land, to animals and to resources is therefore very much on the minds of both Mi'kmaq people and of our allies. Today, I wanna to talk about these relationships as embodied within the very means of expression, within the language and the culture of the Mi'kmaq. So the Mi'kmaq language is part of the very large Algonquian language family. Uh, specifically, we're part of the Eastern Algonquian language family. And like, like the other in, uh, like the other languages in that family, and indeed many other indigenous languages of the Americas, it is a verb-based rather than a noun-based language. It is focused on actions and processes rather than on things. So for example, our word for caribou translates as one who shovels, referring to it moving snow from the land to eat. As Mi'kmaq educator Marie Batiste notes, 
It is built around relationships and the relationships of people to each other, and more important than anything else, it is not a noun-based language like English, in which it is very easy to connect two nouns or to turn a thing that is happening into a noun. In Mi'kmaq, everything operates from the basis of verbs, and verbs are complicated because they show relationships to all other elements around them. Or as she writes elsewhere, the structure of Algonquian languages are centered on the process of being, a cognitive recognition and acceptance of the interrelations of the shared space inform these languages and thus create a shared worldview, a cognitive solidarity and a tradition of responsible action. This process of being embedded in the language itself of relationality and of action carried forward into Mi'kmaq cosmology and cultural practices. There are not the three worlds of heaven, earth, and whatever worlds lie beneath, as described in other faiths, but rather six worlds. The world beneath the water, the world beneath the earth, the earth world, the world above the earth, the world above the sky, and the ghost world, or the land of souls. All beings travel between these worlds, though only boyans or shamans, our word for shamans, can navigate them. Every living thing possesses a soul, even many non-living things. And the distinctions between humans and other beings are not as clear as in Christian tradition. This can be seen in Mi'kmaq myths in which our cultural hero Gluskap calls the whale grandfather, calls the bear grandmother or other fables such as when a woman marries a loon or when a man marries a beaver. While we must avoid the trap of romanticizing indigenous culture, it's hard to escape the biocentric rather than anthropocentric worldview. When a moose was killed, for example, the hunters made sure to prevent the dogs from eating the bones and they were instead kept carefully and made into cultural objects or put into the water the spirit of the animal could see how its body was treated. And if it was treated poorly, it would tell the living animals who would then stop sacrificing themselves as food and fur. When trees were felled, tobacco was offered. Jesuit priests in the 17th century witnessed some Mi'kmaq hunters blowing tobacco smoke into the lungs of a dead bear. David Suzuki in a popular work of popular science describes such indigenous worldviews as sacred ecologies. He writes, for it looks upon the totality of patterns and relationships at play in the universe as utterly precious, irreplaceable and worthy of the most profound human veneration. One of the most unique features of Mi'kmaq culture is that it has a written uh, has a tradition of written language. Indeed, the oldest written form of an indigenous language from the Americas north of Mexico. Mi'kmaq hieroglyphics, or Comguejigasic, translate as suckerfish writings, which refers to the marks left by the bottom feeding fish as they gently graze over as they gently grazed over sandy riverbeds. French Jesuit missionaries in the 17th and then again in the mid 18th century claim to have introduced Mi'kmaq hieroglyphics in order to aid in Catholic conversion. But both of these priests also admit to seeing cultural precedents. And here we see a late 17th century illustration um, from Leclerc. So Leclerc wrote in 1685, I noticed some children were making marks with charcoal upon birch bark and were counting these with the finger very accurately at each word of prayer which they pronounced. This made me believe that by giving them some formulary, which would aid their memory by definite characters, I should advance more quickly than by teaching them through the method of making them repeat a number of times that which I said to them. I was charmed to find that I was not mistaken. John, Co uh, jo John Locke owned a copy of Leclerc's account of the Mi'kmaq. And as Sarah Rivet argues, this description of an indigenous language in part, quote, facilitated the realization 
that language was best understood as a social construct comprising a system of arbitrary signs and words themselves did not provide human access to either divinity or the invisible ideas existing within the human mind. Up to this point in the 17th century, many Europeans thought that language could, have ac could give access to the divine, to the mind of God and creation. Indeed, the hieroglyph in particular was thought to potentially hold the key to the divine universal tongue as a kind of mute language, as Vico called it, as a non-alphabetic way of representing thought. But following Locke, the quest for a universal language was abandoned and the hieroglyph and other forms of indigenous inscription, such as wampum, became relegated to a less advanced societal stage, as in William Warburton's history of writing, The Divine Legation of Moses from 1738. But long after the French Jesuits left New France in the 18th century, the Mi'kmaq continued to use hieroglyphs, primarily in religious worship and Catholic rites, but beyond that too. There are over 2,700 unique ideograms in the Mi'kmaq language. And here is a manuscript recently purchased by Yale of uh, a Mi'kmaq liturgy. Following the transfer of Mi'kmaq to British interests, the hieroglyphics became a symbol of cultural pride, even resistance. In John Knox's journal from 1759, he writes of a British soldier killed by Indians whose, quote, body was all marked with a stick and some blood in hieroglyphic characters. But it's clear by the Jesuit accounts that writing pre-existed their intervention in some form. According to Mi'kmaq tradition, these symbols were used, among other things, in mapping. And numerous early European explorers remarked that the Mi'kmaq had an impressive capacity to draw maps. The best evidence for pre-European suckerfish writing is in the Mi'kmaq petroglyphs that appear around the land. The, Bedfor the Bedford petroglyphs near Halifax, Nova Scotia contain the symbol of an eight-pointed star and is thought to have been cut with stone prior to European contact. The Mi'kmaq star has long been an important symbol uh, incidentally, so has the cross, which uh, pre-existed European uh, missionization. Um, Leclerc uh, adapted the Mi'kmaq star into uh, the hieroglyphic system uh, and used it to stand in for the sun. Yet, a legend also tells us that this particular petroglyph is a map. And its eight crosses represent the seven districts of Mi'kmaq and the one grand chief. The star here is the sun carved into the earth, but with the writing of the suckerfish, a reminder of the sacred ecology to live lightly on the land and to honor our relations. In this sense, the hieroglyph marks a different kind of universality, one which we must all strive towards for our survival. Thank you. Hey, Robbie, thank you so much. Um, that was an amazing prompt for us to um, open up our ways of thinking about understanding place and relationships. So um, we look forward to the discussion. Um, our last speaker is um, Heather Vermoulin. Um, Heather is visiting uh, assistant professor of feminist gender and uh, Sexual, sexuality studies at Wesleyan University. Her research examines representations of slavery, ecology, and queer kinship in colonial archives and contemporary literature and art. Heather's talk is titled Sybil Spider Sybil on Anansi Ness Archives and Spider Space. So over to Heather. Thanks so much. Um, thank you, Cindy, Holly, Kristen, Sue, um, my distinguished co-panelists. It's such an honor to um, think with you this morning and my gratitude to everyone in attendance. 
I want to begin by acknowledging that Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut, from which I'm joining you, occupies Metabasit, land of the Wingunk tribe. This morning, I'll share bits and pieces of a book chapter that turned into a book project, perhaps uh, tentatively titled Sybil Spider Sybil on Anansinus Archives in Spider Space. One, Venomous Archives. On November 11th, while serving as overseer of Egypt Estate, a plantation in Westmoreland, Jamaica, English colonizer Thomas Thistlewood made the following notation in his diary, quote, Old Sybil bit with, with a spider in coffee ground, which makes her delirious, singing her country, etc. Ostensibly, Thistlewood reports an incident in which a spider bit an enslaved woman, whom he refers to as Old Sybil, its venom inducing what he interprets as her delirium, its symptoms, her song. The sentence is both gestural and dismissive. The present tense of makes her delirious suggests that the woman's reaction to the spider bite is ongoing. Etc. simultaneously implies reactions in excessive singing and forecloses their import. The phrase singing her country might refer to singing in a West African language and or about a West African place and or about its people. This Woods diaries do not indicate whether Sybil was born on the African continent or in the forced diaspora. Her country might imply the former, although it is just as possible that she learned of her country through stories and songs. Singing her country might be an act of conjuring, summoning a dislocated indigeneity in another but related site of indigenous dispossession, a plantation field in British colonial Jamaica. The grammatical contortions of this old syntax conspire with his diagnostic gaze to deanimate the enslaved woman's role in the scene. The passive subjectivity of old Sybil bit with a spider and the direct objecthood produced through makes her, compounded by delirious, seem designed to undercut the very possibility of the possessive pronoun in singing her country, to render her song a gabbling, its form and content a mad mirage. In the larger project, I discuss uh, Patrick Brown's 1754 description of the black tarantula, a poisonous spider, later renamed the trapdoor spider. And Brown also associates the uh, black arachnid spite with black enslaved people's delirium, uh, and prescribes rum punch as a sort of colonialist homeopathy. Two, Old Sybil. Prior to the event in question, Old Sybil did not exist. For example, in a diary entry dated November 1st, this would compose a list of enslaved persons in Egypt, including Sybil. He does not employ the adjective old to modify her name, even though he does place old before the names of two enslaved men and four other enslaved women on the estate. 10 days later, old Sybil is bit with a spider. Henceforth, old consistently, um, excuse me, consistently appears before her name in Thistlewood's records. Given Thistlewood's familiarity with a wide range of literature, I propose that he has transformed this enslaved woman into a character in classical literature, specifically the Cumaean Sybil, frequently depicted as raving, mad, and old. I've included uh, on this slide for the sake of time, uh, three translations of classical literature among those Thistlewood took with him to Jamaica, uh, all three of which reference the Cumaean Sybil. Perhaps Thistlewood enlisted classical depictions of the ancient seer and guide to the underworld in an effort to reframe and circumscribe the enslaved woman's self-expression. The overseer's recourse to a timeless narrative featuring an ancient and imprisoned protagonist would operate as an antidote to the enslaved woman's sonic activation of a country that eludes his comprehension and perhaps his control. During the sugarcane harvest four months later, this would list old Sybil as a turner. Confined to the mill house, a turner must bend or turn once pressed stocks back through the second and third rollers of the vertical three roller mill. It is a highly dangerous operation that not infrequently crushed and severed enslaved person's limbs. That old Sybil was in direct contact with this deadly machinery suggests that old is not a description of her age. If the blazing fires and steaming kettles of the boiling house rendered that location the most aesthetically and sensorially hellish, then the mill house is a kind of cavernous gateway to the underworld. Old Sybil, its captive denizen, crushing her prophecies into cane trash. Three, bit with a spider. <clears throat> 
When I came across this sentence seated before Thistlewood's diary in the reading room of Yale's Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library, my mind scuttled elsewhere. I recalled lines from an essay by Wilson Harris on Kirby and poetics. Quote, limbo was born, it is said, on the slave ships of the Middle Passage. There was so little space that the slaves contorted themselves into human spiders. Investigating what he termed the limbo Anansi syndrome, Harris proposes that, quote, the limbo dance becomes the, the human gateway, which dislocates and therefore begins to free itself from a uniform chain of miles across the Atlantic, which in turn serves as a corrective to a uniform cloak or documentary stasis of imperialism. The journey across the Atlantic for the forebears of West Indian man involved a new kind of space and not simply an unbroken schedule of miles in a logbook. What if, unbeknownst to Thistlewood, the spider is a Nancy? Emily Zobel Marshall offers a characteristic summary of this figure and the folktales in which Anansi appears. Quote, Anansi the spider is a trickster folk hero of West African origin. Anansi stories in which the small spider turns the tables on his powerful enemies through cunning and trickery traveled with slaves, of, with slaves of West African descent to the Caribbean. Marshall employs the term Anansi tactics to describe enslaved person's opposition to the violences of the plantation. Similarly, literary scholar Joyce Jonas pits the Spider-Man Anansi against the Great House, the latter denoting, quote, a colonial worldview of binary oppositions and the power structures that attend them. She introduces the term Anansi strategies to characterize the way in which contemporary authors engage readers in this deconstructive pro project. For Pascal de Souza, Anansi's, quote, indeterminacy is revealed in the geographical location and functions he occupies within each tale as well as in the appearance and language he adopts to achieve his ends. Dweller at the crossroads, inhabitant of nooks and crannies, Anansi is never in a specific enclosure, yet never out. Rereading Thistlewood's diary entry solely through anti-colonial frameworks erases a colonialist archive saturated with great house desire for Anansi, including, I would argue, his indeterminate gender, space, and species. In other words, Anansi is to various extents, whatever and whoever a writer, reader, performer, audience desires Anansi to be. It is imperative therefore to ask what makes Anansi possible for whom, in what manner and to what ends. That is to read for what I term Anansiness. To quote black trans studies scholar C. Riley Snorton, whose work is foundational to this project, Quote, what does it mean to have a body that has been made into a grammar for whole worlds of meaning? Unquote. Predictably, the archives that enable rereading for Anansi in Thistlewood's diary are no less entangling and trapping and venomous than those of the black tarantula slash Jamaican trapdoor spider. A case in point would be Letters from Jamaica, the land of streams and woods, published anonymously in 1873 by Charles Rampini, a Scottish author of Italian descent and former district judge in Jamaica. Mutability or undecidability with respect to gender in particular manifests itself in the opening paragraphs of Rampini's chapter on the Nazi stories. Rampini begins with the following romanticized scene, quote, no pleasanter picture of peasant comfort and enjoyment is to be seen in Jamaica than that of a circle of Negroes seated around some village storyteller as he recounts the cunning, ex cunning and exploits of Anansi. In the next paragraph, this image of an adult male storyteller gives way to a seemingly incompatible assertion, quote, the chief repositories of this traditional literature are children and old women. Consider this statement alongside the book's title page, which features a naturalistic rendering of the Anansi spider depicted with, and, and there is a, there is an Anansi spider that's uh, depicted with an egg sac and less gendered female, yet perhaps masculinized by way of its hairiness and size. The Anansi spider's placement beneath the title suggests that she is a stand in for the author himself, her egg sac, his book, her eggs, the stories he relates therein. Perhaps the combination of a real and female but masculine reading spider and spider character, consistently gendered male enabled Rampini to play with such categories without becoming an old black Jamaican woman himself. Anansi stories, and I'm sort of Anansi stories to sort of indicate that they're, they're narrative, um, perhaps relatedly facilitate Rampini's erasure of colonization and transatlantic slavery. Rampini presents the Anansi story as indigenous to Jamaica, 
a child of the soil. When he writes that, quote, the principal hero of this autochthonic <laughs> literature is the large black Anansi spider, Rampini produces a generic and anthropological classification that further and etymologically intertwines black self with soil or earth. More specifically, autochthonic conjures that which lies beneath the earth or in the classical tradition, the underworld. Also telling is Rampini's citation of an unidentified scholar who asserts that Anansi's quote, great strength is in his metamorphic versatility. He out Proteus's Proteus. The author adds, quote, his parentage is utterly unknown, dash, nor indeed does it seem referred to in any of the Anansi stories. This assessment implies that the desirability and value of Anansi's unsurpassed metamorphic versatility derives from and operates within a timeless mythological and thus depoliticized past. The M dash suggests an exciting mystery, a fungible spider story, not the violent rupture indexed by blank space in a ledger. Consider too Rampini's dissatisfaction with Anansi stories departures from the mythological narratives with which he is familiar. Quote, Many of the Anansi stories exist only as pointless, disjointed, mutilated fragments. Others of them break off abruptly, just when the interest has reached its highest point. What displeases Rampini about such Anansi stories is their Anansiness, that is, an Anansiness that differs from and evades his capture and enjoyment of the Anansi stories that would satisfy his desire for Anansiness. Anansi stories do not break off of their own accord, yet Rampini presents teller and tale as interchangeable. He finds fault with this relation only when Anansi storyteller, uh, when they, the Anansi storyteller, orchestrate his climax but deny his denouement. Indeed, like a figure, feverish collector of black spiders, he asserts, quote, the specimens which follow have been taken down from the lips of the narrators. Materializations of black Jamaicans' lips and mouths are ubiquitous in ethnographic and art records of Anansi stories. Such invocations imagine and exploit disembodied yet sufficiently fleshy forms, producing and atomizing the Black Anansi storyteller's flesh, as Hortense Spillers might say, while demanding that their specimen does not break off the body of the tail. Old Sybil bit with a spider in coffee ground, which makes her delirious, singing her country. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Heather, just now, um, Robbie before the head, Emmanuel and Barbara. What um, amazing, amazing papers. I can actually, ooh, I can actually um, clap <laughs> in person. Uh, so uh, can I actually ask our speakers to um, uh, uh, reveal, <laughs> reveal themselves? Um, so, and, I should say I'm I'm uh, the co-organizer of this event with Cynthia Roman. My name is Holly Schaefer, uh, assistant professor um, in history of art and architecture at Brown University, and I am just so thrilled uh, to be here with um, our speakers and with all of you, the audience. And if you want to um, reveal yourselves too, you're most welcome. And more than that, or or in addition to that, I should say, please, please. Um, ask questions in the chat uh, as we open up um, co the conversation today. And what I'm going to do is just briefly um, bring together the papers um, and open up um, to questions. And we have a nice bit of time in or, uh, it, during which we can really um, dig into the question of topography and placemaking. And our speakers just kind of beautifully um, set out, I think, the main questions here, or, to, uh, or some of the major questions. Um, Barbara and Emmanuel, um, I just realized my, uh, I'm going to put the, the lawn has been going. Um, sorry. Uh, okay, can everyone hear me? Um, so Barbara and Emmanuel set out this question of, in Barbara's language, the imperial conceit, the metropole arrogance. And in Emmanuel's presentation, he 
I thought was fantastic just had ego in full capital letters, which really summed it up. Um, and that in some ways is how this pro approach of topography, again, in an early modern context, the notion of place via the visual world, the construction of the visual, um, the construction of place visually. And Barbara asked the question um, of what happens when vision is discounted? Um, and Emmanuel brought in this notion that when imperialism shifts into nationalism, is built into nationalism, which adds a, a, a complex, a complexity to this question um, and, 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 and brings it to the present. And, and those are things I am also thinking so much about um, and I know have, have um, they've been part of recent questions about post-colonial theory when post-colonialism leads into kind of ethno-nationalism or, or that's one of, of course, only one of the paths um, that uh, has taken and that was recently discussed by Perul, Dave Mukherjee in a really interesting panel at the last CAA. Um, and so these questions, both of framing topography as imperial conceit, as ego, um, and then from there asking the question, what happens when vision is discounted, Robbie and Heather um, offered up two answers, right? Two, or rather two um, methods of thinking about what happens when vision is discounted and other modes of placemaking. Um, and I thought, Robbie, you just beautifully articulated through the Mi'kmaq language, suckerfish writing, that it's verb based. And I thought that was so amazing um, that it's about, and this is your language. If I heard you, if I, I wrote it down correctly, actions and processes rather than things. Um, and, and something maybe we can also um, talk about, and I think threaded through a number of the papers was the role of um, cultivation of parts of the earth or the sea that become part of this, like the suckerfish writings, um, the basket of produce, Barbara, in your image. Um, and Robbie, you ended with a question, what happens when we think of the hieroglyph um, as offering a different kind of universality? And that, that I think that's a question we can all ask. That's uh, maybe how to frame this. And Heather, you, um, you added, I mean, what, an, what a fascinating move, I think also through your own process of writing, um, working your way through the Venomous Archive in your terms, where you offered up the question of the sonic, again, as an antidote to the visual or a different, or, or rather just a different frame, not even an antidote, just a different way, different approach. Um, and you also brought in the question of grammar. And so I thought that was really interesting, specific, uh, especially in connection to Robbie, um, Robbie's work, this question of language, of grammar, of um, writing, um, both in visual form, but also in sonic um, form. Um, and, and I'm including the possibility of taste here um, as well. And so maybe we can, how about we just open with that? Um, and as um, questions come in, um, why don't we start with, I guess, this two prong, this kind of both thinking about topography through the question of the imperial conceit, the ego, uh, and as a visual, a specifically visual method of placemaking, and then some of the other modes um, that negotiate with some of, some of the same questions and also totally different questions. Um, and I should say that part of um, uh, the questions that Cindy and I have been talking about within this kind of wider series on topography is um, topography as, of course, a European mode of placemaking, um, and then what and and how it intersects with other modes of placemaking in colonial and also um, um, non-colonial contexts, and what happens when they intersect. Um, and then also what happens when we just think about them totally separately um, uh, as, as, as modes of, of, of encountering place and of the world. Um, 
So I don't know, should, where, who wants to start? Should we, we can start with a conversation among ourselves. And then again, please, I encourage the audience. I know we're a big group, but we can, we can still be informal. And um, I really just encourage everyone to turn on your videos, feel like we're in, uh, I guess Zoom kind of does have the one advantage of we see multiple faces we can pretend to be around. <laughs> uh, we can we can be um, more intimate maybe. So so please take that as as the mode that we're in. Barbara, please. So thank you, everyone. These are such wonderful papers. I really, I was enriched by all of them. And I was really struck by a, something that Heather said, where she talked about a mythological past as being a depoliticized one. Mm. And I was wondering if we could extend, and this is really a question for my fellow panelists, um, does topography also create a depoliticized space? And this is a little bit of a, of a, if a pronged question, um, I guess for, for, ev for everyone, um, how in your papers does topography manifest itself as depoliticized? And what happens when we start thinking about topography as a political space? Don't, don't wait for me, just, just speak. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I think I think in terms of, of of painting conventions, and one of these conventions that gets more depoliticized, it's precisely landscape. And when I teach landscape in my classroom, it's always um, as a verb, because landscape always does. Landscape always creates. And it's precisely this depoliticization that makes it so violent. Because we always take it, we naturalize it, we take it for granted. When my students and when we talk about landscape, it's all, always, always seem like a background. In fact, thinking about landscape in Latin America, a lot of, a lot of scholars don't, don't think about it because throughout the colonial period, landscape seems to be just a backdrop to a lot of these more violent ideas. But when you start bringing landscape to the foreground, when you start like exposing its no nature at this political and propagandistic tool, we realize that it never goes away. It's an intricate part of the visual culture of the Spanish colonies in the Americas. So I think it's, it's thinking about these ideas and then we realize how landscape how it does affects everything that we do. Um, thank you so much for these questions. Um, so interestingly, so um, Hortense Spillers and C. Riley Snorton are, are all over this work. Um, and Spillers uses, um, as she's trying to, to think about how um, gender, uh, uh, white feminism uh, is does not work if one centers transatlantic slavery, um, and what she sort of thinks about as an ungendering in terms of like those terms don't work, uh, and because they're predicated on whiteness and white supremacy. Um, and she uses hieroglyphics of the flesh. Actually, she introduces flesh as a way of trying to name um, not something that's like prior to, but um, something imagined as endlessly malleable, exploitable, lingu like in terms of narratives and um, forced labor. And so I think like there's um, what I'm, what I was trying to think about with the spider bite that I, that is in another, another section is, is there a way to also read the bit with spider as a kind of like, how does that complicate the hieroglyphics of the flesh that Spillers is, is theorizing in relation to uh, plantation slavery, but also um, in terms of the, so yes, yes, yes to verbs. Um, and enunciation, I think, is like how I'm trying to, 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 to do something a little bit different than snorting on blackness and transness and to sort of think about the way that the, the figure of the spider as real as story as character um, works, what it enables. Um, so actually, it's, it, there's both the depoliticizing move of, of kind of translating, recasting Anansi and Anansi stories as kind of classical mythology. Um, but also the way that Anansi sort of figures as endlessly malleable. So 
which is which is just to sort of connect that to theoretically. Snorton, C. Riley Snorton is arguing that trans, the sort of imaginings of transness are um, kind of in direct relation to imaginings of blackness um, via transatlantic slavery and colonization as sort of endlessly um, malleable, fungible. So actually the sort of movement is another piece to the movement is problem is, is appears in the colonialist kind of projects as well. Um, and the sort of move to stasis um, and also the nationalistic projects that sort of like West Indian man uh, in Harris could be one example of that, of conscripting a Nazi into a, a kind of Caribbean narrative that might uh, also erase indigeneity, indigenous peoples. Robbie. On that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I have much to add to that particular sort of um, strain, I guess I'm, I, I've been thinking a lot about what we said earlier about um, sort of the visualization of topography and how, how to imagine it um, as, as, a, as a verb, as a, as a space to be experienced rather than one to be sort of dominated. And that's what I'm sort of trying to build with make those connections, I guess. Can I lean into, because what got me thinking about this was, you know, Emmanuel, when you showed that wonderful Velasco painting of the Valley of Mexico, it uses a trope of the eagle on the cactus, which of course is an Aztec hieroglyph. Um, and it disassociates it by, by putting that in the realm of myth, Aztec myth, it essentially overwrites the fact that the Aztecs themselves, the Mexica themselves, were, were terrible imperialists. <laughs> so it, in essence, takes indigenous landscapes out of the political as well by putting them in this kind of mythological space. So I was wondering about that particular move um, as well. What, you know, what happens when we, when we do that? Yeah, I, it's precisely that because um, Velasco, as pleasant as it is to look at his paintings, um, it's filled with all these political moves. And, and that's precisely why I, I spent a second talking about the Porfiriato, because Porfirio Diaz was so adamant of an intertwining the Aztec past to the nation. And that had a lot to do with placemaking, because it was in Mexico City where you had the capital. It was in Mexico City, the seat of emperors, just like his empire that he was trying to, to construct. But it's interesting, um, I, 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 I fully fleshed this out. And in a way, it's thanks to your question, Barbara, a year ago in CAA. Um, it, it's something that we see um, from the 17th century. It is the way that the Creole intellectuals in the late 17th century start appropriating Aztec history and how they start managing that throughout. So by the time we get to the Porfiriato, everything is already served in a, in a silver platter. So this deeply political moves that erase um, some of this painful colonial history, but also painful pre-Columbian history, um, they already are naturalized. So here enters Velasco and others, and they're just simply part of not only just building of the nation, but it's part of the identity of every single Mexican to this day, you know? Holly, there's, um, there's a couple questions in the chat. That, um, I think there's one from Leah McCurdy um, asking if it's appropriate to think about mythological as non-political or apolitical, which I think we've sort of addressed already. Um, but there's one from um, Vanessa Lyon. Um, and I'm wondering, Vanessa, do you want to come on, come on screen and ask your question? After I wrote it all out, Cindy? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, ask, I'll, ask, I'll ask it pretty much verbatim, but maybe I can articulate it a little more clearly. Um, thanks, everyone, for these uh, really thoughtful and generative, I think, uh, frameworks. Um, but I'm interested uh, to think about, yes, the conceits, the pictorial conceits, the, the traditions, you know, the representational traditions that, that 
condition, you know, these, these images, especially in, in the, the, what uh, Dr. Mundi and Dr. Ortega showed. Um, and so I was just, you know, gesturing a little bit to the, the idea of the festaiolo at the, at the side pointing in and, and that the, it's interesting to see in the long sweep of what you presented the way that, you know, the, the identities and the scale of those, of those figures change in relation to the, to the landscape. And, and I liked very much thinking about, you know, the, ultimately becoming staffage basically, but also what kind of staffage. So, so there does seem to be this interesting moment of shifting. I was thinking over Ortelius and other, you know, earlier um, map makers where the continents are represented by figures, but, you know, from having sort of native figures to going to one native, one indigenous figure and one, uh, you know, colonialist figure. So I, that was just something that I noticed in looking at those images. And I just wondered if you all had ideas about kind of, you know, is this a, a, a diachronic? Is this, is this a change that, in, that mirrors or, or indicates what's going on uh, politically in some way? I, I... I think in case in, in for my paint my paintings for this paintings, um, it really is it's contingent to the history of the picturesque, to picturesque traveling, to picturesque depictions, and what um, that's and uh, the and that's the difficult part. That's the part that took me a year to answer and endless conversation with my students and my husband as well. Is so it why are if Mexican artists are pushing themselves to undo sort of these violences? Why do why do they keep using these same conventions that that diminish the presence and in turn diminish the subjectivity of indigenous of indigenous peoples? And it really is. And I go back to what I was saying earlier. It's a combination of of well, first is teachings of the academy in the 19th century. The, the, the academy in Mexico hired an Italian landscape artist to teach landscape art specifically for these reasons, but also the history of the relationship between Creoles, which are Spanish that are born in Mexico and, mes and later mestizos to indigeneity. And, and this, sort of like back and forth between a pending imperial past, but also diminishing um, indigenous presence. That's how you continue sort of those power, those power relations. To me, the, the imperial picturesque, which becomes what I call the Mexican picturesque, is precisely a reflection of those, those um, power relations or what Sylvia Winter will call, call the terms of exchange. Thanks, Vanessa. I love that question too because it really, I think, that the there is a shift going on that you're that you're picking up on. That all of a sudden we're moving from the kind of indigenous eyes as being our interpreter to all of a sudden needing the, you know, Emmanuel's little clothes guy there who 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 represents um, this shift to um, what Emmanuel talked about as. Um, uh, this, you know, this episte, this universal knowledge um, that all of a sudden universal knowledge gets gets embodied in those. And I think that's an important shift from the, you know, that we see from the late 18th century into the 19th century and um, Emmanuel's period. So I, I, I love that observation. I do think it's an important phenomenon that we're seeing happening. And the map that I talked about Thank you, Cynthia, for, for introducing me to this totally weird curiosity. I think it's a late, um, it's, it looks 18th century to us, but I think it's actually um, almost anachronistic for the 18th century, because it looks to me like an 18th century, per, you know, art is kind of throwing back to these earlier 16th and 17th century tropes. So there's something, but we haven't dated it yet. So so I can't anchor the kind of historical trajectory that you're that you're that you're signaling to, but I think it's an important shift that you've that you've picked up on. And, and just to just to add to that, sorry, um, when you do see indigenous figures a little bit more prominent, their use also um, in terms of of landscape conventions. So, for instance, 
if you think of romantic paintings, Casper, Frederick David and others, we experience the sublime through this person. In Mexican visual culture of the 19th century, we experience the glorious Aztec past through the peasant. We experience the glorious Aztec past through an indigenous person. That's when you see them a little bit in, in, in bigger size in, in, the, in the picture print. It becomes sort of like a sentimentalization of indigenous past through indigenous body. So it's always an object. It's always an object, never a subject. That's um. We we have. I, I think. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Well. Oh, no, no, no. I just oh, wanted sorry. to say quickly. I was really struck by, um, and I just I just want to bring it back to um, today in some ways. And I was really struck by the image that um, Barbara showed of the figures walking down the dirt road from a really high vista perspective, um, versus what we see on television, which is just masses of people without a location um, all the time. So I just curious about that. And then also um, thinking about the ways in which Robbie started or very near the beginning about placing this discussion within um, contemporary concerns. So I, I just, Think that's really important for us to consider how all of these things that we're talking about are still with us today. And I was curious why Barbara actually picked that angle because it's one we don't really see. <laughs> Suspect you had a strategy. And like I said, there are some. Yeah, I, 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 it was when I was looking through. I was thinking, of course, the the border and what's happening there. Um, vis-a-vis -vis these constructions of nationhood and, and citizenship. And when I started looking at photographs of the border, yes, you get that. You get the close up, the mass bodies, um, the hordes invading that trope. But the trope of, the, of the, the topographic view is so imprinted on the structuring of these photographs. Um, and I was like, when I started to think about adding that in, it just became so incredible how we live with this legacy of, of 16th century topography. We're still carrying it on our backs in our visual imagining of, of phenomena. And I guess that, that might also be one is to, to, to pause constantly and just recognize, just take back that naturalization and the convention. Um, there's a, a wonderful question by Bethany Qualls. I don't know if Bethany wants to, do you want to say yes. it yourself? Great. I can talk. I can say things. I just think uh, sometimes better out loud. So um, yeah, these are great. I mean, obviously I'll just echo everyone there, but I'm thinking a lot about water now um, and how it sort of came up sometimes, but not always, because of course we can't talk about everything. Um, but what kind of work water does that's different than these landscapes or these mountains or this cityscape map vibe? Um, and, you know, is that even pulling those things apart? Is this like, again, Western epistemology that I've been swimming in for decades, um, just making me think about what typography means? Um, like land versus water, right? We all have all these dualities, oral versus written, right? Like, the mythic versus the real. I was like having a, a total deconstructive moment um, and thinking about teaching. Uh, but yeah, I was just thinking, especially with Heather and Robbie, um, how water is working for you. Um, clearly, Robbie, you're saying, you know, now this is still the livelihood. This is the, the water and the land are working um, for the Miqua in a really obvious way. And Heather, you're thinking about the Middle Passage and the results thereof, which of course happens with the water. So, would just love to hear more about water. That's pretty much what. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it definitely factors really heavily, obviously, into the Mi'kma ethos to cosmology. I mean, not to the, like we were maritime people, not to the same level, perhaps, as, uh, you know, people of Pacific, where water is totally like kind of part of their um, embodied existence in so many ways. But yeah, I think that like the the sort of the suckerfish writing itself kind of is that beautiful merging of those things, isn't it? Where it's you know the the marks on the bottom of a of a sandy river that are kind of ephemeral yet transcendent, um, and so yeah, water functions in, in that kind of 
that way in the in the Mi'kmaq um, way of seeing the world, and and off obviously is totally the site of conflict uh, as well at the moment. But um, but yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. I don't know if um, Heather anything to add. Um, yeah, that's thank you. Um, so one thing that that came to mind in the section that got cut from this um, is that uh, a sort of small river or stream uh, that ran through Egypt and state was uh, called the River Styx. So sort of like that. So yeah, I had a whole whole thing about about that and, and thinking about like um, in, in relation to forced transatlantic transport, like the um, the notion of of people who who died at sea having to wait to be buried. Like there's sort of all of these like going back to um, the Aeneid. There's all of these kind of moments that. Thistlewood, I think, has a very literary imagination, and so I think he is doing that kind of work. Um, in terms of, I actually think my sort of other project is on uh, the contemporary artist Ellen Gallagher's oceanic art, thinking about transatlantic slavery and marine biology. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a sort of parallel project. Um, but someone like um, the theorist Edouard Glissant uh, uses the sort of construction land sea to try and trouble those, um, those divisions. Um, Tiffany Lothabo King, uh, Black Shoals, uh, a book that just came out last year, I think, um, thinks about shoaling uh, as a way to, um, as a site for thinking indigeneity and blackness together. Um, that's sort of one, one other text that comes to mind. Christina Sharp uh, in The Wake um, on Blackness and Being uh, is also thinking about the, the Atlantic uh, as a, yeah, as a sort of space, um, yeah. Way to theorize. So yeah, those are my those are my in the moment thoughts about that. But yeah, absolutely. Those are fantastic. And I should also say that as we continue this conversation tomorrow, that Kailani Polzak will be speaking about um, uh, the ocean within a different um, uh, through Cook's voyages, and that Gary Magutta, uh, an amazing artist, will also be speaking about. Um, uh, um, with Chitra Ramalingam about um, her work uh, that also traverses oceans uh, and delves into birds and mineralogy and other items. So please come back tomorrow. Um, we have uh, some more fantastic questions. Um, Mink, Ete, do you want to ask yours or should I go, should I ask for it? Please, if you want to. Is that she here? Hi there. Great. Um, yeah, I was um, really interested by the, um, the the look and the progression of the the the, the maps of um, you know the, of the lake and the kind of Aztec city, and and the way that it progressively became more kind of overtly um, you know um, filled with signifiers. But I was wondering um, whether the 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 initial map it it i may be mistaken but that was kind of a, a top-down fairly straightforward map of of the city and and the surroundings were there um were there um kind of inherent imperialist signifiers within that map or within the context that that map got sent to spain besides um the overt kind of imperialism of Cortez's, you know, kind of, mission. I suppose, self-proclaimed mission there. Um, but were, were there anything within that document itself that, um, uh, you know, you could read into in that sense? Thank you. Thanks for that, that really good question. Um, I've argued that the base, the thing that actually got sent back from Cortez was an indigenous map. So it gets kind of rewritten in this Nuremberg context. And you can see that he uses the Nuremberg artist who's translating this into something that fits into that mode of the Jerusalem map. Um, he or she is translating, probably he, the maker of the woodcut is translating what would have been probably hieroglyphs of Aztec cities um, into like little conventional views of towns. And then at the very top of it, they're also sticking in the big Habsburg banner. So that's a sign that it has been taken over and turned into both a kind of Europeanized and Habsburg space. Um, 
Yeah, so there are all of these other kind of imperial signifiers that are getting laid onto that map um, and its convention. Um, but I also, the, the water in that map also connects to Bethany's question, which I think is a really interesting one because, um, you know, in the Valley of Mexico, and Emmanuel will know this very well, the water itself is a huge threat. And the city, the original city of Tenochtitlan is built in a very different way from European cities. Um, and it's built to kind of take into account the, the water and the ebbs and flow of the water. Um, so your question really starts, starts me thinking about whether in the representations, water as some kind of indigenous other, <laughs> an uncontrollable indigenous force, um, how it it's, itself gets, gets represented in this translation to a really a domesticated space um, for for Spain, but I think that's a really Emmanuel. You probably have water all over your. <laughs> in in fact, in the night in in the painting of Velasco, you see some of the last water from the lake, and as part of the group of scientificos or scientists of of Porfirio Diaz, you had engineers that were working on 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 emptying the lake. But if you read the, the writings of those, of those engineers, they, they continue to do the work of people like Velasco, of, of, of talking about how Mexico City is the place of the empire, and just like it was in the Aztec. So the lake and the fact that now they control the lake, the, the same lake where Tenochtitlan set up, it's such an important signifier for this ideological um, political propaganda of, of, por, of Porfirio, or Porfiriato, yeah. Yeah, the uncontrolled Aztec waters, or the uncontrolled waters are those of the, of the indigenous pre-Columbian past, so the great desiccation of the lake, which happens over three centuries, is the triumph of, of, of European engineering. And of course, Mexico City is, is the, one of the largest eco disasters today, exactly because of that kind of application of of knowledge about water and water systems. So we're getting towards the end of our time, but um, we have we have a question from Kristen, which I hope she'll come um, up and ask herself. But before she does that, I noticed kind of a return to um, writing and textual topography. And I just um, want to put a teaser out there um, because I keep coming back to um, Samuel Johnson's 18th century definition of a topographer as someone who writes history. And so all those collections of topography in great libraries are filled with books about histories of places in which illustration is kind of added, but it's first about writing. Ah, Kristen didn't ask that question. Anyway, um, somebody else did, but it's coming under Kristen's name. So I don't know who did ask a question, but I guess we can just read it. Um, I'd like to bring up a native understanding of place with Keith Lasso's Wisdom Sits in Places, where he talks about the Apache fuse um, history and land, how the Apache fuse history and landscape to teach morals, manners, and one's social and tribal history. Um, is this something um, common with the Mi'kmaq um, uh, meant uh, one's place in tribal history. Robbie, is that something you want to take on? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, yes, it definitely is a, a, a common thing for sure. Um, and like other indigenous myths, uh, typically they're about process rather than moral. You know, so there's 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 not necessarily villains. There's not necessarily uh, heroes, um, but the landscape often features very heavily um, through the sort of the main cultural figure of Gluskap, who's uh, sort of a Mi'kmaq cultural hero, was involved in creation. But one of the things I was kind of thinking of that's that's interesting about Mi'kmaq topography is that the land itself is often depicted as a character, as a living character, and sometimes parts of Mi'kmaqi are considered, uh, you know, the giant's head, the giant's foot. Um, and, and what does it mean to sort of think about that space as kind of like literally living and teaching continuously? And how can that be sort of mapped? And how can that be sort of thought of in, in the sort of topos, I guess? Yeah. 
can I, can I ask a question? And I, I want to make sure we get to Ajay's uh, question. So Ajay, if you're there and you want to speak it yourself, please, um, uh, you can open your video. Um, because I'm interested in the question of topography, as Barbara was saying, is politicized. It has a politi It has an ideology within it, right? As a as a word, um, and we're interrogating it, and one must interrogate it from that. But does it offer something like Ravi? When you just used the word topography, do you do you what do you think about using that word or using a different word? Does that does that make sense? I mean, I, you know, it's, it's fine. I tend to think of sort of things as, as landscapes um, in, in a sort of, in a, in a different way, I guess. But uh, um, yeah, I mean, obviously it's fraught in, 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 in that broader tradition for sure. Holly, may I do it? Let's explain a little bit what I wrote because yes, it was, please. what was interesting about, uh, I think Barbara's image, I, I hope everybody realized that huge, uh, the figure on the uh, left um, is, I was really struck by the fact that the pasted image actually also overlapped with the skin. And I wondered if there was a possibility of counter reading that. So therefore, because a lot of this discussion is whether we want it or no, or whether we are struggling to find other means of looking at it, driven visually. And here, I thought that there was a little bit of a, uh, an opportunity to see if there was a cross history, reading something back the way Robbie is trying um, into the image, uh, you know, in a more haptic sort of way. And I wondered whether there was a tension evolving between what I'm calling in my comment as this topography, as this kind of colonial uh, uh, politicized in this fashion and visually driven as opposed to topoplasty uh, that I see. I kind of a tattoo that is also create, generating a sort of a camouflage effect in the body. Um, so that there was a kind of a way in which you, instead of saying just the figure is here on this, and then there's, let's say, which is sort of true, the universal versus local knowledge that we also heard about, whether there was a way in which the indigenous is writing back or in some sense, kind of re-emerging uh, quite haptically, you know, in, in dermatological way within the topogra topography that is being described on that landscape. That was my curiosity, really. Thank you. I, I, lo I love that as, a, as an opening. And um, because when, when you look at this object, the, the creator has pa pasted down the map and then painted the tropes, the Aztec tropes over them. And of course, the map then is bleeding through the figures. So the figures literally look like they have the map imprinted on them. Um, yeah, this is this could be super, super productive, particularly when paired with indigenous or, or Mexica or Nahua notions of the skin and the importance of, of the skin as the kind of manifestation of the real. <laughs> Um, so I think that that could be a super, super productive line of entry into this. So, so thank you for suggesting it. If I can um, follow up on that, it's a it's an amazing question. Um, and I think that's, again, I go to sort of Hortense Spillers on a hieroglyphics of the flesh and then sort of thinking about what what that might mean in, in the sort of construction um, bit, civil bit with spider, um, which is the sort of deanimating move on Thistlewood's part, but also perhaps points to a kind of entanglement um, that that is uh, a sort of multi-special assemblage or something like that. Um, but one thing that, and in another part of this project, I'm thinking about um, an obsolete definition of kin or use of kin uh, as a crack, chink, or slit, especially a chasm or fissure in the earth or a chap or crack in the skin. And I've been trying to sort of think about that as like a way of um, bringing together like the human and the non-human, the geological and the biological. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's just what you were saying made me think of that as well um, and sort of something multi-sensory as opposed to um, a sort of visual regime, for example, in, in relation to the, the topics of this panel. Um, 
I'm noting, so I'll be the officious timekeeper person, that it is um, 11.49 and um, we have a keynote at noon. So if people uh, wanna take a break, we should do so now. Um, and we're gonna have a conversation after the keynote. So conversation and questions can continue then and also tomorrow. Um, and I hope in, in future um, programs where we'll all get to meet in person. So anyway, um, we should be back at noon-ish, please, so we can start the next part of the program. Thank you to everyone, to our amazing speakers, everybody in the audience who asked really wonderful questions. Um, thank you so much. And we'll see you in a few minutes. So, um... Hello, everyone. Welcome back to uh, the workshop on topography, viewing topography across the globe. Um, and we are just absolutely thrilled um, uh, to introduce you to um, our keynote for today, to Nupa Hanska Luger and um, uh, Marina Taikinko, who's going to be introducing him. And I'm just going to uh, introduce Marina, who will then um, introduce Chenupa. Um, so um, Marina is a Chamorro scholar of global indigenous art. She is currently a curatorial assistant in the Department of Contemporary Art at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and a PhD candidate at the University of Pittsburgh. And I can say she's also a brilliant teacher as well as a scholar. She, we were lucky enough to um, have her in our department at Brown. And so I just wanted to also say that, that note. Um, uh, so please, Marina, I turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Holly. Hafa uh, day, everyone. Na'an Husi, Marina Tekenko. Um, so I'm so happy to be here. That was just, me saying my name in tomorrow and I am very, very, very excited to uh, join you from Providence, Rhode Island, which is the traditional territory of the Narragansett and Wampanoag people, many of whom still live in this area and call it Surrounds Home. And I'm tremendously honored to introduce the keynote speaker, Tanupa Henskalugar. His practice is so tremendously wide ranging and incredibly rich for thinking about so many topics, including topography. So multidisciplinary artist Tanupa Henskalugar is of Mandan, Hidatsa, Arakara, Lakota, and European descent, and communicates stories of 21st century indigeneity through social collaboration, performance, and monumental installations, which incorporate ceramic, steel, and fiber. Luger is a re recipient of the 2021 United States Arts Fellowship Award for Craft and was named a GRITS 50 Fixer for 2021. He exhibits lectures and produces projects globally. And right now he's installing a show as we can see. And today he is our keynote focusing on the Americas. So please take it away, Tanipa. Hello, my friends. Who are you and why have you come? I am uh, currently in Mesa, Arizona. This is the ancestral lands of the Anka Kamala Otom, um, extension of the Otom territories. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm installing an, a, a, a show. So I came down here because I figured rather than a PowerPoint, I can just walk you through kind of what we're working on presently because it feeds into all of these narratives and uh, this is a rare opportunity. You could always go on to the, <laughs> the website from here to like do a keynote so, or a, a PowerPoint just by scrolling through my website. So this I thought was, would be kind of an interesting introduction into um, some of the ideas that I've been working with and um, what that looks like applied. Um, I guess uh, I would like to say uh, thank you for the uh, patience and, and um, listening with me here today. And uh, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all and to present this work. Um, here at the Mesa Arts Center in Mesa, Arizona, we're installing this um, group show that's called Passage. And um, an extension of Passage is a socially engineered project uh, that began two years ago. Um, COVID kind of Put another year of, of hold on, on the exhibition's opening. So we are um, 
finally allowed to come in and open up the space and invite uh, the community to come in and engage with it. But this will be the only kind of physical presentation of this work. Um, and then the pieces will, uh, from the exhibition, will re be returned to the land afterwards. So it will exist as like a, a digital archive of the entire process, um, which is what I think is the most kind of beautiful part of art um, is how things get made and how you encourage people to make things with you. Um, I guess as a little bit of a background to uh, and context into this space, I'll, I'll talk about these projects that I've been working on that are called, um, I call them Counting Coup. And uh, Counting Coup for uh, a lot of Plains tribes in, the Amer in uh, North America is kind of like the highest, uh, uh, you know, for lack of a, of a better context, like military uh, achievement that you could do. Um, counting coup involved facing your enemy and uh, not harming them, but presenting your name and telling them that you're not afraid of them. And I think that there's something profoundly beautiful in that uh, concept of what combat could look like. But to um, uh, with that being said, I'm, I, the counting coup projects that I work on are the transformation of um, data into scale so that people can like basically just rehumanize data. Uh, more often than not, the data sets that I work with involve um, lives that have that have been taken away from us too early, and um, and more often than not, that that as like an outcome is based on dehumanization. And um, I just don't know how data, you know, being so impersonal and dehumanizing could be the solution to the problems that it creates um, or that has you know the effects of dehumanization so this is a way to try to rehumanize data and allow people to comprehend large numbers and data sets and transform like the number you know in this instance nine thousand from one number into nine thousand individual numbers the project uh, here is called something to hold on to and it started a few years ago um, as I was going through data around um, bodies found on the US-Mexico border and um, the kind of militarization of our, of our southern border with Mexico uh, cleaved a, a separation, not just geopolitically, but also within the, uh, the agency of indigenous populations in the Americas. This um, geopolitical gap also encourages a gap in our in our customary and, and ancestral paths of, of movement. And so the project is called Passage. Uh, I wanted to, it was, I guess it was probably around 2018, 19, when um, around 2018, when the president uh, at the time was like declaring these, um, these caravans of, of folks coming to the Americas and feeding all of this fear and, and stuff. And I just saw the way that the country responded to um, people seeking asylum um, who crossed vast distances to, to move into a place that their ancestors had the agency and the freedom to do so prior to any kind of geopolitical stance. And I wanted to like recognize that relationship and amplify like an indigenous kind of um, agency of movement, uh, especially when I was seeing so many numbers of, of the folks seeking asylum come from indigenous communities south of the, of the US-Mexico border. And, um, and I just seen the same kind of uh, deployment of, of militarized forces. Uh, that seems to be the standard kind of response Response to indigenous gatherings of any sort. And so I wanted to do a project that looked at um, lives that have been, bodies that have been found, not lives lost, but bodies found on the US-Mexico border. And at the time that number was around 7,600 um, dot, dot, dot uh, numbers. And it's, a, it's grossly underestimated. And so I thought it would be really interesting to create this project, something to hold on to, which takes a clay bead um, and I'm going to move you through this. It takes a clay bead. It takes a piece of clay that you squeeze in your hand, and um, the the pattern of your hand kind of wrapping around the clay 
uh, is what is used as a data set to like calculate all of these bodies lost. So you, you've created something to hold on to and somebody who you may never, who you will never meet. Um, and I made a short video on how to do this sort of work and moved it uh, onto social media and asked people to participate, kind of amplifying empathy on the, on the, on the internet, as well as creating a, a, a real physical experience for um, people to participate and understand like what that means outside of, outside of um, whatever they see on news or anything along those lines. So I also worked with a couple of artists from um, Arizona. Uh, this is Breeze, uh, Thomas Breeze Marcus and Dwayne Manuel, who are both um, Otham. One is uh, Tahona Otham and the other is Ankakamelo Otham. And uh, they created this really beautiful labyrinth pattern that comes from, um, it's like based on some visual language that they've uh, had in their culture for time and memorial. And it's about the movement of um, your body through the world. And through that movement, you create this, um, this labyrinthing path that moves towards the center and then um, you transform into, a, into another world and perhaps another uh, path that you need to walk. So in this instance, I'm asking the audience to move through this path and to experience a border um, outside of most kind of American understanding of what a border is, which is like a 20 minute wait um, in any, uh, uh, you know, checkpoint along the way. But for most of the, of the world's population, the border really is, does limit movement. And so this forces the audience to, to move through and to experience that border recorded by these pillars of, um, squeeze beads and then you comprehend and recognize when you look at the scale of all of this what nine thousand people look like and you have to walk through and you can't can't cross this border and it follows along this path all the way in towards the center and all along the way there are little gaps little gaps that you can um like cut through and cut across and make your journey quicker if you choose, which I think also reinforces the idea of what safety and security looks like and how most humans um, will choose a, a quicker path if that is an option. Um, those who stay to the road, stay to the path and follow will find themselves in the center of this labyrinth without um, an exit. And so they have to turn around and go back the way that they came, which I think is poignant in response to US policy around um, uh, border politics. So it takes a while to move through this as we are walking through right now and you're experiencing it over my shoulder. I do apologize if it's a little nauseating. I'm trying to walk as slow as I possibly can and not shake too much. But there's a lot of um, vertical lines that are, you know, could be disorienting. But you find yourself in the center of this. And everywhere you look from floor to ceiling is a symbol of that loss recorded in clay. And now each one of these beads have been unfired, which allows, um, it allows this kind of symbol of a life to return to um, the earth once this exhibition is complete. I think that's important because uh, um, you know, certain responsibilities around people, uh, especially when we're dealing with lives um, in response to, to all of this. So that's a, that's a little bit of a walkthrough. This, this project has, has like multi-tiered. Um, I'm working with another uh, writer and photographer um, who has 
gathered photos of um, Tohono O'odham landscape and environment. These are just the little pinups of them right now. The larger photographs are actually framed and still in plastic as we finish up the install before we put them in. But when you enter into the space, the first thing you'll experience is the land. And I think it's important, just especially from an indigenous perspective, this like relationship to place isn't about ownership or possession, rather belonging. And acknowledging the land first, um, I think, is important. And I know most institutions are starting to do this with their um, their land acknowledgments. But most land acknowledgments acknowledge the people who were settling the land prior to to the colonial kind of land experience, but do very little to acknowledge the land itself, which has been here the whole time, and has um, influenced the cultures of the people who, who developed within these landscapes. And so I thought it would be important before we engage with this, with this passage and this path that the audience is first enters into the space and experiences um, you know, the, the beauty and the awe that is the desert landscape, um, particularly because the US has used that beautiful desert landscape as its police force in policy to move um, uh, 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 moving people, uh, immigrating people, migrating people, it funnels them through kind of a harsh part of the desert, which is the Sonora Desert. And um, a lot of the lives that have, have passed have happened here in Arizona, of the bodies that have been found anyway. Um, and, and with that, we, I'm working with another artist, Tanya Winiga, who does a lot of work her projects or um, her group projects are like Ambrose, but she does a lot of beautiful work herself. And she created a pop-up um, kind of information space on, and, and uh, call to action. And, um, and we created this map, or this is just data plotted. And that large swath of red that you see up there is the Arizona-Mexico border. There's a little peak of Tanya. She's busy working right now. Mm -hmm. um, here, she'll wave. No, she won't. <laughs> she did, but I moved it. Anyway, uh, all of this kind of culminates in this, in this collective experience, which is called passage. And um, I think in response to, to topography, you know, even in this digital age as we're moving 3D scanning laser vehicles to remap our environment. Um, people become a part of that uh, uh, environment. And when people become part of that environment as like tiny, um, I don't know what you would call it, uh, 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 peninsulas, you know, of the landscape, that creates a, a, a pretty interesting um, kind of honest depiction of what human beings are on the land. It reinforces the fact that we belong to it and that there is no separation between us and our environment, but rather um, we are the, the environment. We are the land. Um, and there are certain kind of protocols that should be in place that a lot of indigenous communities had because they had that acknowledgement and that recognition of belonging um two spaces so it's like just a bit of, of about this project and ideally i know we have a lot of people that are in here but um if if uh rena would be so kind or anybody um uh, want to filter questions in i would love to talk with you um in this kind of rare <laughs> opportunity rather than at you and i feel as though i presented a lot of the um ideas that that are moving forward with this i might go into another room because i think it's going to start getting louder in here uh, as we move forward oh he's heading out never mind uh, there's that scissor lift on the go for uh, i believe it was was it nico or i can't remember who <laughs> mentioned something about scissor lifts this is the reality yeah Hey, Chupa, thank you so much. Um, that was so exciting and also 
wonderful to see an active keynote moving around a space as opposed to, as you said, like just a static one of pictures. So I don't see any questions in the chat yet. Um, I invite everyone to ask questions. And I thought maybe we could just start with something kind of bringing together two things that you said. So um, I talk a lot with the museum world about land acknowledgements being for people, but I think you make such a good point that land acknowledgements actually do little to acknowledge the land itself. And it relates to something that you also said that I've heard you say before, that also just speaks to a lot of different indigenous people, this idea that people belong to the land rather than land belonging to the people. So I wonder kind of um, what would it look like uh, in most spaces to acknowledge the land? What would that kind of be like in your well, we have, we literally have customary like openings to prayers and um, ceremonies that are, you know, would be considered land acknowledgements, but they are, they're based on um, an acknowledgement of forces that are much greater um, than, than ourselves, you know, uh, human beings have kind of like put themselves in a, in a position of, of great importance. Um, and we acknowledge the four directions. We acknowledge the winds that come from those directions. We acknowledge the, um, the, the phenomena that those winds bring, like southern winds with warmth um, and moisture, northern winds with cool air. Um, there's, like a, there, there's a whole protocol around a, a honest land acknowledgement. And then we acknowledge also the more than human kinships that we have with other species. We acknowledge the animals that migrate and move through our landscape and, and uh, that we can live with and um, learn from, you know, uh, there's, a, there's an acknowledgement of this extension of a much greater network, which I think creates a much stronger and holistic relationship to environment beyond, uh, beyond this concept of dominion you know, where, where we dominate over all of these sorts of things and um, force things to exist within our narrow scope of, of human experience. Um, and I think once we begin to acknowledge those sorts of things, um, the people who, who most kind of like institutions want to recognize become an extension of that, you know, rather than what I find with, with most kind of institutional land acknowledgements is that it, it acknowledges these people primarily because it justifies its own settler colonial um, ideas. And it says, we weren't the first to settle here, you know? Um, uh, so it's, it's okay that we settled the way that we did because we weren't the first people. There were people before us, you know? And it exists in a way that kind of justifies the brutality of settler colonialism um, without really understanding that I think completely, you know, um, I think it's, it happens, it happens accidentally, you know, um, to, to kind of like subconsciously justify um, extractive and settler colonialism on, on an environment. You know, it's like, I, I acknowledge the people who were here before us um, and that makes me feel better for being here now and extracting from this environment and settling on this landscape. And, um, and the cool thing was I, I wasn't the first one to do it, you know, um, which kind of seems weird, you know, in a way. Um, so I, I like the idea of acknowledging the land and building a, a responsibility to that environment. Um, and that maybe changes the way we, we, um, we look at the land, you know, as of right now, most, most Western kind of dominant cultures look at the land as resource when really we should be looking at the land with reverence, you know? And if we can change that way that we think about our relationship to place and we suture back together this, this wound that um, was presented generations ago that, you know, man versus nature like that is such a strange narrative that pulled us and separated us from our environment and uh we subconsciously live in the wake of that statement you know but it's just an idea it's it's not true we are our environment we are the land we are nature um and if we can mend that that wound, I think it changes the way we respond and relate to our environment. And if we can change the way we respond and relate to our environment, then maybe we can change the way we respond and relate to one another. 
um, as extensions of that. If you can see me um, as a part of your environment and you have reverence for it, you have reverence for me, you know, um, and vice versa. So, so those are just a few kind of little ideas that, that fit within that, that question. Thank you, that was such an expansive answer to what um, I thought was, uh, I don't know if it didn't really know which direction that would go in. So I really appreciate thinking about that and, and kind of reflecting on the fact that land acknowledgements acknowledge an owner when indigenous relationships to land were much more reciprocal and didn't really fit, as you said, into that traditional kind of settling. So just saying we're the next in a line of settling is, is insufficient. Um, I'm gonna start kind of taking questions. I have a lot more questions for you, but I think that I wanna be as generous as possible. And so um, I'm gonna turn to the chat. If you wanna read your question, I think just um, for the sake of making it easier, put your name, like put say in the chat that you wanna read your question. And if not, I'm gonna read it for you just to kind of keep us moving. So the first one that I see is Barbara Bundy and she says, I love the residence between your counting devices and the ancient Indian kipu. Um, are those visual forms, um, are you thinking about other indigenous visual forms, other forms of counting? So um, kipu, I think Cecilia Vicuña has made a really famous example of the disappearing kipu, these um, Indian counting systems. Yeah, like uh, it's the knot system of counting, right? Specific mm -hmm. knots for specific numbers and stuff. Um, coincidentally, it looks the same, but um, Honestly, how this piece was presented um, came out of necessity. Uh, I originally wanted to suspend the, uh, the strands of beads in one continuous line, um, but uh, I had gravity in my mind, but not uh, compression of, of gravity. So as I hung these on these circles, not only did they fall down, not only did gravity pull down on it, but it also pulled in on it. So it became impossible to navigate the, um, the, the path without restringing another, um, you know, uh, 150 some strands to suspend that weight. So we kind of adapted to the variation and it felt, um, it felt more honest to that experience. And it also created a little bit more of an environmental experience rather than a, um, than a, than a um, physical kind of like borderline. It started to look like the velvet red rope. Um, and I was like, I don't know if I'm a hundred percent, like I don't aesthetically like the way that that unfolds versus presenting it floor to ceiling. There's something really nice about the uh, gaps and the possibility for people to take shortcuts that wasn't possible in the other one that I think um, opens up kind of broader questions rather than just continuously walking on that line. But coincidentally, it does have a kipu, kipu like uh, um, aesthetic. Uh, and I think that's um, has a lot to do with the fact that, you know, the homo sapien hand made them. And like this squeezed piece of clay, um, when I first started this project, I came across, um, um, oh my gosh, I'm absolutely, forgetting her name. Um, there's, a, there's an artist in Canada who did a project, um, uh, an indigenous artist. Oh, what is her name? I feel so awful that I can't recall it right now because I called her once I saw she had done a project using the clay in the, um, in the river bank and was folding clay and squeezing it with her hands. And um, once I had seen that work, I wondered like, oh no, this is a very similar kind of aesthetic. So I reached out to her and asked, you know, like, look, I'm about to start this project has a different purpose, but the, um, the bead, the call to action is literally a, a squeezed hand uh, or squeezed clay in, in the hand. And uh, she had said, um, Rebecca Belmore, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca Belmore. Oh my God, I'm so sorry, Rebecca, if you do see this. I couldn't pull your name up right now. Um, but yeah, Rebecca Belmore was like, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that this is the first thing ever made by human beings in clay, like a, a squeezed piece of clay in the hand. And we were laughing about how it might even be older than humans, like some previous sapien uh, species probably was making these um, for fun on a riverbank. 
So I think it's that I think is what is kind of really interesting about this is that that clay also has its memory and movement and migration and has traveled the surface of the earth. And we as people have uh, uh, engaged with that material for a long time across different cultural backgrounds. And I think it's important to see the variety and color of, of the clay beads and um, as an acknowledgement of the different lands that it, that it comes from. So that's my short answer. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, and I was, uh, as you were saying that, I was thinking about the way that, you know, cave drawings and cave, there's always like the impression of a hand. So then thinking the opposite way that the hand would squeeze clay um, just makes so much logical sense from like a human standpoint that you'd like put your hand on to make a mark, but then take something in your hand and make it with it. And also just you're a trained um, trained in ceramics um, and working with them from AAA. And so to kind of make this a, an outsourced project, what kind of clay shapes can people who don't know how to use ceramics make? And I think that that's such a, a, a you know, smart natural solution. Um, yeah, the one thing I would like to add to that is that because we are looking at a data set and I want to acknowledge um, um, the individuality of those numbers versus their, them at scale, that's something that's really interesting. Even if I made 4,000 of these, just because of the dexterity of the hand, every time you squeeze it, it changes just a little bit, you know, and then asking hundreds of people to participate in that created a really diverse kind of experience for every single one of them. Great, well, I think that the next question um, is about kind of related to that. So Susan Walker asks, where does your clay come from? And are there sources of clay? And it seems like there are many sources of clay, but are there sources of the clay significant and related to your installation and message? Um, they are from all over the place. Um, some of it is uh, repurposed clay from universities that we kind of transported and moved to do small workshops, but primarily most of these beads come in in small batches from people who want to participate. So I have no control or knowledge of what their clay is. I know as we were stringing these beads, I came across like a whole batch that um, I uh, looked like it was just dug from the earth. It was filled with um, uh, a variety of other materials. So it was really nice to see the complexity and that diversity of that. And whenever I do these sorts of projects, I always think it's important not to become too specific, um, which allows, um, I don't know, the more, from my experience, the more like expectations I have, the more disappointed I am. So I try not to have expectation. And what I find is I'm pleasantly surprised by the outcome. If I read <laughs> expectation becomes a limit on the, on the possibility, you know? Yeah, because I think to do something to that scale, there's so much unpredictability. So I think that's such an, an interesting, great approach. And I mean, it looks fantastic. Um, so there's some really nice comments and a lot of people suggesting kind of sources and ideas. But the next question that I see from the um, chat is from Isabella Robbins. Um, hi, Isabella. Did you want to read your question? Just uh, sure. I, I can read it. <laughs> uh, Hi all. Um, yeah, I just want to give my camera off because I'm in California and we didn't wake up that long ago. So I look a little, a little crazy. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate your consideration um, of the desert as this kind of like rough in many ways, but also beautiful non romanticized space. Um, I'm Navajo, so I'm also from the desert, but I'm curious, um, and this is something I think about a lot in my own work. Um, but how you're thinking kind of about yourself as an indigenous person, like as a nomad in uh, kind of migration in some ways or, you know, in movement away from your ancestral homelands. Um, I'm wondering how you think about kind of those ideas of diaspora, um, migration, movement, nomadism in your artwork. And if you think these ideas you know, between indigeneity and migration clash, or if they're more connected um, than you think. And then also just thinking about that specifically as an indigenous artist who in many ways has to travel um, to these different like sites and museums to, you know, create work, exhibit work, et cetera. Thank you. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's really, these are really poignant questions. So like my, um, 
my cultural background, like I'm an enrolled member of Mandan Hidatsa Arikara. Um, the Mandan and Hidatsa, we were, um, were river people and we were agricultural people and we built these kind of like large earth villages along the banks of the, of the Missouri River. And um, so we were a, a lot more sedentary in the Northern Plains than a lot of the tribes that were around there. Um, but also on my father's side, I'm Lakota. And uh, this was a nomadic people who moved and followed uh, uh, certain migration paths and um, environments. You know, it also based in a, in, a, in a story, it's like the homeland is massive. It's not a small space, but that you navigate within that space and you adapt to change. And I think that's something from a human perspective, like around the, around the idea and, and you know, of, of diaspora, um, I, I, I often wonder about that. I think it's hard. There's no like Native American diaspora, you know, um, just because our cultures are too varied and too broad and have, um, uh, there's no kind of like umbrella, you know, diasporic kind of experience. Um, once you break that down into like the individual culture groups, um, some folks moved, some po folks didn't, you know, and I come from, a couple of folks who did both, you know, one, some that stayed and some that moved. And um, I do think about this a lot though. I think about this more so in, you know, less around diaspora, but more around um, displacement and how there has been so many policies uh, throughout US history that has um, kind of like pulled communities apart and moved them into urban settings generations ago. And then entire, um, you know, generations of indigenous people being raised outside of their ancestral lands and, um, and may not ever get an opportunity to experience it the way that I had the privilege of kind of growing up in North Dakota and traveling. Um, so I grew up in two spaces. My parents divorced when I was like two years old. So I spend my summers in North Dakota. I still return home to North Dakota every summer um, for ceremonial purposes, but um, my mom moved into the Southwest. She's also an artist. And that's kind of, kind of how we ended up in the Southwest. And so, so I, I kind of grew up in this desert landscape and this um, Northern Plains landscape uh, as a kid. And then beyond that, like as I became an adult, I moved into like Pacific Northwest coastal regions, um, uh, urban settings, you know, uh, but I still like presently I live in New Mexico. Um, up in the mountains outside of Santa Fe in this little town called Glorieta, which is like a mountain pass um, right outside of Santa Fe. And it's been a pass for like time and memorial. There's a, there's, you know, Interstate 25 runs through it now, but this, all of this country is kind of like traveling infrastructure is based on native uh, uh, traveling routes. And there's very little acknowledgement of that as far as contributions to um, U.S. stories. And because there was that much movement and that much migration, I, difficult to reinforce this like diasporic kind of narrative because, you know, outside of the restrictions of reservation kind of politics, um, we belong to this place. And if you can change the way you relate to that, if you, because I grew up with a, with a chip on my shoulder thinking, you know, as I traveled around and looked at the, the, the country, I'm like, man, they stole this from us. It was all stolen. And um, as I got older, I started to understand and to recognize that like, this was never our place where it's people. And there's no way, no, there's no border, no line, no policy um, that can remove that. You can even take my life and my people still belong to this land. And that's a different kind of narrative. And I think most diasporic kind of experiences is, is a much further removal from their land and environment and culture and I think we have access if we're willing to, to, to see it, you know, and it's a, it's a shift in how you see yourself in relationship to, to the land. But yeah, I love your part of the country. I must say, I live in New Mexico. So Deneta is uh, some, some beautiful uh, uh, land. Uh, I have quite a few friends in that region. Some of my best friends are, are Dene. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, Isabel is a very good friend of mine, so I'm sure she's very happy and such a great response to her question. 
Um, so I have another question from Eleanor Newman that she'd like me to read. And she had some really nice words to say, but I'm just gonna kind of get to the question part. Um, I'm curious to hear more about your emotional experience of making um, those beads and whether the creation of this sculptural and embodied data visualization somehow changed your understanding of the violence on and across the US border or other political boundaries. Yeah. Um... Well, for the most part, you know, I asked community to make these beads. I did a couple of workshops and sat down with different groups and different economic and socio-political spaces to, to sit down and make beads. And it's a different experience in all of them. Oftentimes you have to kind of like, it's, it's interesting. I, the workshop aspect of it, um, a lot of times through like institutional spaces is that people show up to do a workshop with Chinupa. They don't show up because they have an empathetic response to, to, to the concept of the work. Whereas people who do it at home and send these beads, I, they don't get to hang out with me. They saw a video and were emotionally um, connected to the, to the concept and contributed um, in a way that is like a much more emotional kind of experience where, you know, when I see, um, when I do workshops, a large point, you know, a large, a large part of it is trying to give the workshop people context to why we are doing this, um, uh, rather than like how many can I make in the in the you know hour that I'm here with this artist, you know. And I'm like, it's not about that, you know. It's about recognizing that each one that you make represents a, a life that was lost. So there is, I mean, there's absolutely emotional. Um, impact of that especially once you start looking at these numbers at scale and you walk through and you feel the gravity of of um of what that looks like you know i'm like i don't i don't care necessarily um what your like mode model or purpose for coming was other than you tried to make your life better like in any sort of way, shape or form. And, and that I can like understand completely and respect. And, um, and you see that like sacrifice made for in that effort. Um, and then you see it at scale and you see all of these little lines behind me. And each one of those lines has dozens of dots made of human hands, you know? So it does, it does stack up and it does, it does get heavy. And I think I've done other projects like this where I have to steward the work after the initial exhibition and then move the piece in from one museum to the next. So, so that was something that I learned is that it is, it's really heavy, you know, um, not only physically, but emotionally, the weight of it is, is too great to kind of sustain as, a, as an individual, especially when so many people contributed to make it. And so that's why in this project in particular, I wanted to exhibit it once here in Arizona, where it is um, just, this is the bottleneck in which uh, US policy moves so many people through. And so I thought this would be the most poignant place to present this work. And then also to allow this work to disintegrate back into the landscape. Um, but yeah, it's heavy and it's, you adapt and you change and you consider new ways of doing things, you know, I've learned things from doing this one that changed for the next one, you know, uh, and that's, that's all we really can do, you know. Definitely to adapt and change. Um, so uh, Ting Chang actually asked a very similar question or kind of you, I think you got to some of the answer, but I'm just going to go ahead and ask anyway, can you talk about your process or consideration of lightness or heaviness? The ropes of clay are beautiful and light, whereas the history of the bodies are so heavy, which is what you alluded to. Um, but then uh, Ting Cheng also said the verticality versus the horizontality. Um, so this is, I think, more of a question about the way that it kind of came to be aesthetically and then those considerations of height, heaviness and lightness um, yeah. usually. Yeah, well, originally I wanted it to be horizontal and I thought that that would be the best way to um, to basically limit the agency of the audience. Um, I'm here in Mesa, Arizona. The, the demographics that go to museums are a very specific demographic. Um, and so I thought it'd be important to limit their agency, limit their, their um, uh, I guess, entitlement to movement through borders. And so if I hung them horizontally, they couldn't really cross the border line. 
you know, which I thought was interesting as, as like a, uh, uh, something contrary to their experience. Um, but as I began to hang them horizontally, I had physics uh, to deal with that I didn't account for um, in its suspension. And so uh, I always wanted to suspend them from the ceiling rather than raise them from the floor on like stanchions. And because of, to, to reinforce that lightness, you know, uh, um, kind of idea uh, and to float them basically to create a barrier for people to pass through um, and to not make it permeable, you know. But I thought it, once that kind of physics came into play and, and failed, I was like, I have to adapt to a new kind of idea. And by hanging them vertically, um, the exterior kind of like arcing wall that moves around the uh, perimeter of it has a much tighter vertical line. And as you move more towards the center, the spacing between each vertical thing opens up and that allows you to um, take shortcuts, you know, to step off of the road, to bypass and, and, and to cut the, the border line. And um, suddenly that seemed a lot more important than limiting their movement, but to see if they would step off of the path if given the opportunity. Um, and that kind of changes the narrative and the dialogue of, of you know, this, this like perverse invasion narrative of <laughs> people into different land environments. It's like you you you'll do it to take a shortcut to get to move five feet like um consider that when you're when you're considering uh, uh people moving across continents and what i really appreciate from it is thinking about kind of other contemporary practices that are meant to be this environment that you interact with there's often kind of a and there is a, a spiral there's a way that you're meant to interact with it but you're kind of initially thinking about how people are going to take shortcuts, right? There's a route that you can take, but you're never not actually expecting people to take it. And it makes me think about, um, you know, a lot of early earthworks that was like, there's one way in and one way out and you have to go that way. And what a different kind of experience, um, you know, going to the gallery and seeing this, this piece and moving in it will be for visitors. Um, so I think that that's all the questions in the chat that we've asked, so I'm gonna, go back to the ones that I've kind of uh, pre-crafted and thought about in relation to your work. Um, and there's just, again, so many directions that you can go to, but I keep returning to this idea of the clay going back to the earth. Um, and I think that it reminds me of that really fabulous series that you did um, the with breaking of stereotypes where you created these fabulous um, ceramic sculptures that were shaped like stereos and you named each of them individual things and I can share a link in the chat. Um, the one that you kept was actually named for you, the Luger. Um, so I wonder if you could maybe talk about this really interesting part of your practice about the idea of breaking things, returning them to earth. And then if you think that, or how does that relate to maybe um, this general topic of uh, topography, which you know literally means the writing of place. So thinking about this question of like, as part of your practice, you return things to the earth. And what, is that, what does that say about topography? What, is, what does that say about what you, um, how your practice you know, is meant to return to the earth? Yeah. Well, I come from I come from a culture that had an emphasis on oral traditions versus written traditions, and topography and writing the land. You know, um, I don't know. I always think about how like a lot of the visual languages of a lot of tribes, a lot of indigenous people, just globally. You know, um, the visual language is highly conceptual. It is not the thing, you know, reproduced to its complete accuracy. Um, but rather it is the idea of the thing, the shape of the thing, but not necessarily the thing itself. And um, I noticed that even in, in like Hidatsa and Lakota languages um, that I'm closer to and familiar to, I'm not fluent in either, but um, it doesn't have an emphasis on nouns. Everything is verbs. Everything is, if you want to describe something, you describe what it does or where it's from and how it interacts with that space. And that's what it is. It's not, you know, um, I always think of like, like the badger is, is if you translate the name for badger from Hidatsa, it literally means earth digger. Um, and so it, I, it, if you look at that in like, um, this is one of the things that's kind of like 
difficult, I think, around written languages and also even maintaining indigenous languages is that you're stuck with this dictionary model of, of how to decipher language. And it doesn't emphasize primarily some of the things that are most profound around different languages, which is how and why they describe their environment. You know, um, I think the Western kind of colonial um, and more so like empirical science kind of like uh, uh, compartmentalize, label, isolate kind of narrative um, puts an emphasis on the nouns of things. And our entire world is just like this stack of nouns um, when in reality, it's always in flux, it's always changing. You, you, by the time you finish doing a topographical map, it changes. Um, so you, you've just completed and created a lie, you know? Um, the truth is the, the landscape itself. The truth is the way you wayfind by, by paying attention to your surroundings rather than looking at a map that is one step removed from your environment. Um, topography oftentimes from my experience is based on control and dominion over land. Where am I gonna write my border? Where, where is the edge of this place? But when you're in that place and you relax, you see this kind of like network of connection all the way across. And so a lot of the ideas that I try to create that involve kind of returning things is that, you know, as a ceramic artist, I often ask myself, is this worth being ceramic? Like, is it worth taking this clay, which has endless possibility, infinite things could be created out of clay as long as you don't fire it. Once you fire it, you move it into a, a crystalline form. And now it can only be this and broken versions of this into the future, you know? Um, so there's a certain responsibility around, around uh, moving it through that, that um, chemical change, you know, that physical change. And uh, I like the idea of, of um, returning it and allowing it to be. Moreover, like the big kind of insight for this, as far as returning it to the land is, um, I'm working with, with folks from Tahona Otham Nation and they have distinct protocols around returning things to, to the earth. Um, oftentimes as developers build in Phoenix, Arizona, they come across sites of, of Otham villages and, and different you know, communities from the region. And they uh, give those, you know, after they do all, all of their anthropological isolate label and categorize these, these um, sites, um, they give them back to the people whose ancestors created them and then they give them back to the earth and they have ceremonial protocols, songs, movements, ways to do it. That seems far more important than anything that I've developed as an artist within the 42 years that I've been alive. So I'm like, that seems right. You know, uh, uh, as, as you, as an extension of this environment and this land, I, I need to follow your protocols. Like I respect what your people and your relationship to place um, kind of developed. And so I followed through, try to, I want to follow through on that, um, especially because of what these objects represent. Um, I think it's important to give a, give it all back, you know? Um, but there's other, there's other purposes. The whole, um, stereotype scenario was the concept for that was like stereotypes are not necessarily subject to entropy the same way physical objects are. So it was important that I fired them and made these objects so that they were trapped into something that was so fragile that if I just let it go, it would fall apart, you know? Um, and that was kind of the narrative with that whole scenario. It always varies. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. And I think that that really points to something that is said a lot um, about indigenous studies, but that is something that actually really exists in practice is this idea of time immemorial, right? So um, the people, people, they they have a time immemorial practice of how they return things to land. And as a visitor, you're following it, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that's so important and kind of important to, to continue to like think about as we move through places as indigenous people that we're not indigenous to. Um, Okay, great. So I am just checking to see if there's more questions. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of really great comments in the chat. Uh, but please feel free to keep asking other questions. And until then, I'm just gonna, um, oh, it's almost time to go. <laughs> this is so great. Chingup, I really have just appreciated all of your really thoughtful answers and walking around. And I, um, as someone who works in the curatorial field, I love to just ask 
um, a little bit about your curatorial practice and how, you know, when I talk to artists, there's this such a different emphasis on making. A lot of curators, um, especially curators of Native art, are also artists. Um, I'm not an artist, but I, I wonder how you think of, you, you know, your practice of bringing artists together. You also collaborate a lot with um, different people, different artists. Um, I saw, I read about your really fabulous um, play in LA as well. So I just wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit about um, how you think of if curatorial practice is an extension of your artistic practice, and then maybe a little bit about uh, collaboration and then I want to maybe be respectful of your time and, and um, organizers' time and maybe close things down. Yeah. Um, well, I collaborate. I collaborate out of out of necessity. I mean, the reality is I've never done anything alone ever. So acknowledge that relationship. You know, acknowledge who's supporting, who's helping. Even for myself, I have to consider like. Is this a collaboration or am I hiring somebody to create something for me, you know, and, and be very specific around the wording and the language of, of how you engage with that. Um, I think it's, I think, you know, as far as a curatorial aspect, um, they don't want artists to curate exhibitions. Like there are, there are folks um, who are paid salary to, to, to curate, you know, within most institutions. And so to have an artist do it, like that's kind of mind boggling, but one of the kind of like um, cooperation and collaboration and invitation for people to kind of like stand in solidarity with work, you know, uh, like, you know, is this a collaboration or are these two individual pieces that relate to one another in such a strong way that it becomes one? Um, or does it remain two and they exist as, as independent, but uh, reinforce one another, you know? Um, all of these questions, I think, come into play. And as I, from my curatorial standpoint, I don't ever really consider myself a curator other than that I encourage, um, I encourage collaboration, which then suddenly somehow manages to um, uh, organize uh, artists to collaborate and to work with. When I first got started in this, like it was impossible as a, as a native artist to show and work with anybody who wasn't native. Like we were always kind of restricted. It was always like that, that show, you know, this is the, this is the black show. This is the Indian show, you know, um, this is the women's show. Like it was, there was always that compartmentalized narrative of we're going to create, um, we're going to create space for you and yet not acknowledge the intersectional space that we've been maintaining without this mechanism in the first place. So how do we share that intersectional space? And I think collaboration <coughs> reinforces some of those ideas um, of, of intersection, you know, um, that lattice work of, of connectivity. And then moreover, like I said, we love to like, um, we love to celebrate an individual in this country. This country has a myth and a narrative of rugged individualism, you know, um, that was never, it was, that was never real. Like it was just a total bold faced myth and lie, you know, uh, and, uh, and that keeps us separated. You know, if, if it keeps us in competition as well, as long as you believe in rugged individualism, then you can go it alone and uh, devil may care, you know, I don't, I don't care who's, I'm not here to make friends, you know, <laughs> like that, that whole narrative just moves all the way into the 20, 21st century. And it's like so gross and disappointing. So I think it's important to recognize that we don't do things alone. And that, that's a sad, that is a sad goal. You know, that is a sad place to like celebrate and pat yourself on the back, you know, that you, that you lifted yourself by your own bootstraps. And I'm just like, what sad fool doesn't have a single friend that can't help lift him up, you know, that he has to somehow defy gravity and do it himself. I'm like, you're just sitting there on the ground, tugging, tugging at your shoes. Like that is not real. Um, so I like to kind of reinforce this idea yes. of cooperation. Yes, that's right. Yeah, where are you now? Oh, I'm right, here. Um, can, <laughs> can someone who is, um, we can't see you, but I think someone has their sound on and they're taking a phone call. So um, if you could mute yourself, that'd be great. Um, I, I think I love that. I love that answer so much, Snoopa. And I think, you know, working in the contemporary space, I'm trying to kind of break down those borders and integrate Native art 
everywhere that I can, everywhere they'll, they'll let me at the institution I'm currently working at. But, you know, it's important to, to kind of remind ourselves that the, the bootstraps idea is a myth about to kind of ignore the fact that some people just have so many more advantages all the time. So the only people that have to lift themselves up are the people who have less for whatever reasons. And that I think, you know, I just always think about there are, there are, as you say, there's no one who doesn't have a friend and there's, there's no one that can really do that because, you know, we all can, we all have come into spaces with different individuals and from an indigenous perspective or different indigenous perspectives, you know, you're never just doing something for yourself. Um, and I was thinking about the kind of migration story and so many scholars I know who are um, native or indigenous, like their whole goal is to kind of get back to their communities, to get back to like helping people. And I think that that's, that's also something I think about is like, not just what you're doing individually, but there's kind of an always like thinking back to who can I help, right? That's so important and so kind of opposed to that bootstraps rugged individual idea um, yeah well i'll be honest it's also like the highest form of wealth that's embedded in my cultural upbringing you know um uh it's not about how much you have it's how much you can give the more i give the more wealthy i am within the cultural context of my people you know so um you know it's nice it's a good way to run a, a society and a community and a culture but also i'm like I'm flexing my 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 wealth. I'm flexing my privilege, you know. Um, and and I think it's important to acknowledge that that you can do that. You can use your privilege to to um, to uh, celebrate like your own success in a lot of ways. And the more that you can do that, it's just a clear example of how successful you are at it. So I'm still wrapped up in that whole weird, you know, uh, uh, narrative. But I'm just using a completely different filter <laughs> yeah completely well um okay i want to really respect your time and we still have several people here um but one of my my colleagues at the mfa she always asks this question of artists that i think is is kind of good and i've, I've um, seen it be pretty pretty good you are someone who has talked a lot to curators a lot to different kind of arts people is there a question that you haven't been asked that you would like them to ask of you that you would like to answer um and if if not that's totally fine but I just thought that you know the the, the final final word should be yours so um is there something that you wished curators yeah. would um I don't know how far away can I get to allow you to just make whatever you want like uh <laughs> that, might, that might be a nice question. Am I am I too close right now? Can I step back a little bit more? Um, I don't know. I don't know if I have like a, a curatorial kind of kind of question. I think oftentimes, um, I think everything's shifting in a lot of ways. I think you know, curators have been celebrated for. Um, there is a creative aspect of, of organizing other people's art into a cohesive kind of collection and, and, and narrative. Um, but I think, I think that institutional space has a, has a much larger reckoning. I think, I think curators are the mouthpiece of, of um, uh, uh, a board and, and those who have kind of like financial um, uh, leverage over an institutional space. So I don't know if it's curators that I necessarily want to talk to um, as far as opening up that question. You're, you're limited as well, you know? Um, but I think it's important that we recognize that um, most institutions, most gallery, museum, kind of uh, educational spaces, they're in the business of preserving culture. That's, that's, that's their business preserve culture, to share it with community and whatever, but its emphasis is preservation. Artists, we're in the business of maintaining culture. We maintain it with everything that we make. We maintain it and keep it uh, uh, up to date. And we adapt and we move and we shift and we, and we do what we can to allow our, our story as a reflection of the society that we're a part of be emphasized. And um, I think it's important to acknowledge that you need us a lot more than we need you. We're gonna do this without you. Um, and, and I think it's important to, to shift that power dynamic. That power dynamic is so offset right now because you know there's a, there's a vast difference between preservation and maintenance. And uh, maintenance is immortal. 
preservation is eventually doomed, you know? Um, and that's, that's what we do. And I think that's what humans do. And I think that's what we want to do, but we've been kind of like wrapped up in this preservation model through academia, through institutional, through economics, commodification, all of this sort of stuff is, is like an emphasis on preservation versus maintenance. Maintenance is where real growth happens. Um, and so I, you know, I don't want to ask you a question. I want you to ask yourself a question. Am I, am I preserving culture or am I maintaining it? Thank you for that. And I, I am very, very aware that we need artists more than um, you need us. You know, we study to be able to talk to you. Um, so definitely a great point to keep in mind. And the limitations of any one group of individuals working in a museum who isn't running it is also something that I'm sure for you comes from a place of working with so many institutions and having that like deep knowledge of like who you work with and kind of who does what right within the spaces. Um, so I think uh, with that, putting, putting the curatorial field in its place, um, I wonder if we should um, kind of end this conversation here. Uh, thank you so much for staying on extra minutes to talk to us. I've really appreciated all of your really fabulous um, answers and also the um, sharing of the space that you're working on now, uh, which there's a link to. It's the Mesa Art Center, correct? Correct. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much again to Holly and Cynthia and Kristen McDonald for organizing everything. Um, I'm going to um, also say thank you to Chnupa. And do you have any housekeeping things, Cynthia or Holly, that you wanted to add? No, just to say thank you for everyone. This has been so um, provocative and it seems like we have so many more questions to ask artists and um, scholars and even curators <laughs> going forward. So um, I hope we will continue this and many of you will go along that, that passageway with us. Holly? Just to chime in a tremendous thanks, I think. Um, and it was incredible to be able to join you within the space of your exhibition and to think about that question of maintenance. I think that among so many other things that you spoke about today um, will, will be with us. Um, and also the land acknowledgement for tomorrow is already changed. <laughs> so <laughs> for that also tremendously grateful. Um, just to just, I guess one note is that we will continue this conversation tomorrow with, um, uh, more brilliant speakers. Um, and we really hope that everyone will be able to join us for that as well. Um, and just with one great, maybe we, if, if anyone who's there, you can unmute and, and reveal yourselves and let's give um, Chinupa and Marina a great round of applause and our speakers um, for today. Thank you. Thank you, Chinupa. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.